A very good morning once again, bringing to you live the ninth annual Mineral Wealth Conference happening here at the next Media Park under the theme Mineral Value Addition and the Future of Mining. Let's take you live. Catherine, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is day 50 of the 90 days of Uganda's oil and mining sector. I take this pleasure to welcome you to our annual Mineral Wealth Conference. My name is Catherine Wabomba, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. I'm joined by... William Chizito, um, Advisor on Investment at the Chamber. Uh, we do have a very interesting uh, conversation that we have planned for you today. Uh, and so without wasting so much of your time, I want to hand this to our Chairman of the Board of Trustees at Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, Honorable Richard Kijuka, to take us through the next session. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I am pleased to welcome, first of all, His Excellency the President, and all of you who have uh, managed to attend today's ninth Mineral Annual Wealth Conference. I welcome all those who are listening and watching us on NBC Uganda, and all those from all over the world who have joined us on our online uh, platform. You may know that uh, this is our ninth uh, annual mining in Daba that we as Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum have held without fail. And we're extremely excited that uh, you have spared time to attend. Uh, we are also thankful courtesy of modern technology notwithstanding and certain COVID-19 uh, challenges. Permit me to once again, thank His Excellency the President, who has kind of agreed to close our conference uh, later today. But more importantly, let me welcome our Minister of State, uh, Saro Pendi, representing the Minister of, Minister of Energy and Mineral Development that have been anchor partners with us in the Chamber, Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. I want to thank all our partners, all our sponsors, I will not uh, go into a list of naming them, but we uh, sincerely appreciate their support. I want to thank NBS for providing this, us with this wonderful facility, 90 days of talking about oil and gas and mining. I want to thank, above all, our young secretariat uh, of the chamber for a job uh, well done in organizing uh, today's uh, function. You know, today's uh, main objective of, uh, co of, of today's conference is largely to invite uh, what I call serious investors, not only from Uganda, but from all over the world to come and invest and focus on Uganda's attractive mining sector. Many of us may wonder why Uganda is not a well-known mining country destination. The reality is that apart from several artisanal and small-scale mining operations, Uganda, Uganda's mineral sector is essentially what I call at an exploration stage. We must, however, salute a few players who have pioneered into this sector, gone into exploration, and have been able to have proven quantified mineral resources discovered. And all those 
who are already in the field, who are in the process of making uh, world-class uh, discoveries. In, in consultation with the geological department, I think for the benefit of the audience, you wouldn't mind me mentioning a number of these companies that have proven reserves. First, let me start with the, uh, the Sukuru phosphate. I'm sure my, I will hear more. Our friend Dennis uh, is, uh, will soon join us in the discussion. Sukuru phosphate uh, is a, uh, put up a fertilizer plant and a brick factory that was commissioned in October 2018. Guan Zhou Dong Song is the company that produced bioorganic fertilizer. And it's amazing what work has been done when it was distributed to the tea, sugarcane, and other farms for planting season tests. The results have been remarkable. I'm told that the, the, the plant has commenced production uh, in September 2020. Uh, meanwhile, construction of the steel plant, sheet glass factory, and slug cement plant awaits the release of funds from the ICB bank, ICBC bank after cost processes are settled. We hope they settle soon than later. May I really emphasize the fact that this project in many ways answers what we talk about as value addition. Because in one place you receive from one ore the several elements that have been able or are due to be extracted from this ore. Second, Kalembe mines. You, you, most Ugandans know that uh, Uganda has used to produce copper from Kalembe, but the potential for copper and copper is great. We believe that the proven reserves of about 5 million tons is not what Kalembe is worth. Actually, the real work is to get on with exploration and explore more resources so that you have an integrated project. I am informed that the Minister of Finance, Minister of Energy and uh, Justice, together with Kalembe Limited, are busy trying to identify a new operator. But my message from a private sector perspective is that the sooner we do it, the better. We can either afford as a country to sit on a project for more than five years and we do not see action. By the way, in terms of value addition, as a youngster, I used to be, I became a manager of a bank in Kilembe. And Kilembe at that time used to employ well over 5,000 people. In terms of generating revenue, in terms of generating foreign exchange, it used to earn 30% of countries' uh, foreign exchange. And the infrastructure that they were able to put up in terms of housing, in terms of roads, in terms of medical facilities, second to none. So can you imagine if we had 10 of these mines across the country, what that would mean in terms of transformation? The third one, I'm talking about proven reserves. The third one is Namakera vermiculite. These produce phosphates, but also this ore. We can, they are able to extract iron ore, they, apart from vermiculite, they can also extract uh, phosphate. So in terms of value addition, there is a, a great capacity. This mine produces 30,000 tons per annum of high-grade um, vermiculite. Number four, in terms of gold, you may have heard, in terms of value addition, African gold refinery that was set up around, uh, uh, that was commissioned, I think, a few years back. We are happy to report that the Wagagai Mining Uganda Limited Group have a proven reserve in the east of about 12 million tons uh, in Arupe in Busia. This is uh, at the stage where they are developing uh, a mine. And I really think that uh, government must support it so that within the next two years, we have a fully fledged operational mine of that magnitude. Uh, we also, uh, I should mention that Simba Mines and Minerals have also discovered uh, gold res uh, resources of about a million uh, ounces. I'm talking about proven reserves 
in Ibanda and uh, the company is undertaking mine development with the state-of-the-art underground tunnel uh, ready in place. I should also mention HEMA cement. So HEMA cement has been with us. They have also made a discovery of about 500 million tons at Rupa in Moroto. Uh, but what, uh, what is interesting is that this is for marble. But about a few years back, they were able to do a great job, made a discovery of huge limestone, and they were aimed, they were aimed, <laughs> they were aimed at, uh, uh, at, at producing uh, clinker so that you can add value. Now, uh, I'm informed our, all our participants are here. I will jump this story of giving you more uh, discovered minds. I will come to them when we are making a discussion. Only to emphasize that uh, as far as I'm concerned, there are many companies that have made discoveries, and there are those who are in the field, including uh, uh, Javis Mining, including Samta Mines and Minerals, Renzori Rare uh, Metros, and so on, in terms of rare earths. We shall be able to address this uh, during the discussion, and we'll have opportunity uh, to discuss the various aspects of value addition. We shall be able to appreciate that mining is a long-term business, that it takes a long time from the time you are involved in exploration and the time you are operating a mine, leave alone adding value. We will have to appreciate all these aspects. So without uh, wasting uh, time, uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity. Before we get into serious uh, discussion of um, you know, value addition to address today's uh, topic, I would like to uh, uh, invite Professor Kwesiga uh, to come and give us uh, a brief uh, uh, presentation on the role of minerals uh, in terms of how it transforms society to being industrialized. You have the floor, Professor Kwesiga. You have what it takes. You are welcome. You can speak from there. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be here, especially to be introduced by Sir Rich, who was my, uh, in 1964, I met him. He was a very powerful man at Ontario School, captain of Mbaguta House, and he accepted to adopt me. <laughs> I was his son from 1964. And it was indeed a privilege to, to, be, uh, to be a son of a, the only man who could afford foreign shoes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been a quite a, a pleasant experience getting to know Sir Rich. Uh, I am from Uganda Industrial Research Institute. That's a institution that uh, we have... Uh, uh, we have heavily involved in value addition uh, and other, other endeavors. Uh, I'm an industrial engineer by profession, Ugandan born, uh, but uh, an international citizen because of the... I only have 10 minutes I see from it. And, uh, uh, it was tricky because there was a lot of uh, publicity about this meeting. So I started planning a, a real big deal presentation. And when I saw the final draft of the agenda, I said there were 10 minutes. Okay. So what I intend to look at, we have been heavily involved in uh, value addition to uh, agrarian products. But this year, we launched a project, which I invite all of you to come and see at Naman the Industrial Park, that is addressing uh, metallurgical issues uh, from, uh, from machining to manufacturing. And all that is uh, looking basically at the, uh, the 
the metallic products. And the foundation for metallic products is minerals. Uh, just like value addition to agrarian products, the basic the basics is agriculture. So, uh, how are we doing? When I was setting up that uh, the concept for uh, uh, for Naman the project, I looked at a, a very uh, I did a little research to see what how many uh, how, how many things are we making for the uh, metallic sector. If you go to a a hardware store, ask them for a product made in Uganda. You'll be surprised. You'll be shocked, actually. And that's what we're trying to work against. The beginning, the alpha and omega of that kind of, uh, of a metallurgical uh, facility is uh, minerals. Minerals starting with mining, like uh, my senior was talking about, through me, uh, the mineral beneficiation or adding value, and then make them uh, those uh, added value minerals as inputs for industrialization. We can't go any other route. That is how to go. And so, uh, and we need to do it fast because if you look at the industrial revolution, today we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution but we have hardly embraced the first industrial revolution of 1784 when they invented the steam engine. And the steam engine made it possible to mechanize agriculture and the wealth thereof uh, ushered in the era of industrialization. We have to follow that path and move into manufacturing and uh, add value to our minerals. Uh, I, as I said, uh, the, uh, the flow, simple, mine, add value, then industrial. Make your own technology. This, most, this uh, pandemic has given us a rude awakening. Dependency on foreign technology. Defend, dependency on foreign uh, Industrial, industrial products can be very detrimental to our industrialization effort and to our development. And so, uh, I am, as the Uganda Industrial Research Institute, we have taken yet another initiative to create a model mineral value addition center. The concept will be read to you uh, Honorable uh, Richard, uh, before the end of this week. And we must move very quickly to uh, put that into, uh, into action. Uh, I don't know if I have any more. Yeah, you still have three minutes. Okay. And so, uh, the story we've, we've uh, learned from, uh, uh, from uh, the creation of NAMA and the project is that we are very slow at embracing the industrial revolution. We, are very slow, we have been very slow at uh, realizing our, uh, uh, enacting the, uh, the whole process of industrialization because we are not creating enterprises. Enterprises, including uh, the mining sector, the mineral sector. Why are we not creating enterprises? Because we are not uh, fully uh, embracing the issue of appropriate technologies, applying technologies. We are not doing a good job of creating skilled manpower. The human capital is critical. Interestingly, we are really, we, we seem to be working at it. We have a lot of vocational schools. We have a lot of uh, universities teaching engineers, but somewhere along the way, we are not delivering the skills we need. Uh, instead, we are de uh, delivering uh, 
high sounding certificates. Somebody has a first class honors degree in mechanical engineering. You take him to an industrial uh, shop, a workshop, they are lost. So we have to approach that. We have to deal with that issue that we enhance our capacity to deliver on uh, technical skills. Uh, and of course, there is the other area of uh, affordable financing, but that somebody else is uh, tough, and uh, we have to also visit that. And then you see, when you go to these uh, emerging economies, uh, even first world economies, they all have uh, uh, banks dedicated to making it possible for small scale industries to function. Um, I'm glad that Rich is a banker, has been a banker uh, at a global scale. And so it should not be difficult for the Chamber of Mines and uh, 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 Chamber of Mines to really uh, advise government and uh, take initiatives to find, uh, to, to find uh, affordable financing for the entrepreneurs. Uh, then there is another sore thumb as far as I'm concerned. The level of entrepreneurship is extremely wanting. Even if you put in, we are provided the technology, the human capital, uh, entrepreneurs who are half-baked will not, uh, will not uh, reach the promised land. We need to address that issue also. Uh, and so, Finally, I, as I said, I'm going to I'll be submitting a, a, a concept paper, uh, probably even by tomorrow, so that we can really start, uh, you know, addressing the fundamental issues of technology and skilled manpower. The market is there, but development will not happen unless and until we address the inputs for industrialization. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kwesiga. Uh, uh, that, uh, I think, th those comments by, were by the way of introduction to our exciting discussion this morning. Uh, I think you, you, you were able to emphasize the fact that you were... A country has a meteorological workshop with state-of-the-art equipment ready for anybody to go and, uh, uh, and, and get on with any project that one may conceive of. That's my immediate take, which I would like, uh, I think we should salute the country for having that facility. Uh, you are talking about uh, the world facing fourth industrial revolution. And for minerals, that's a very important point. The point is, what minerals do we focus on in terms of making a difference for industrialization? Is it any mineral or some of them? These are the relevant questions. Because when you talk about minerals of the future, you are talking about uh, the Teslas of this world who are in the electro vehicles. What sort of vehicle uh, minerals are they looking at? The kinds of the nickel, the kinds of cobalt, kind of rare earth, and whatever. So, how are we positioning ourselves is the question as I lead to the next discussion. Panel discussion one is addressing the issue. How can mineral wealth contribute to the social economic transformation of the country? And we are really privileged to have Saro Pendi among us. He had docket uh, in the government uh, is the responsibility, she's the Minister of State in charge of the mineral sector. So we could never have been better uh, presented. So, Sarah, with your permission, if uh, you don't honor the minister, I, I would be pleased if you could initially give us a sense of how you are positioning the country to really make sure that minerals uh, contribute to the socioeconomic advancement of, in general before we go to specifics. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um... Can I call you Sir Rich? You are most welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Rich. 
I remember when I was working with Uganda Consolidated Properties and you were the minister in the Ministry of Trade and Industry and I walked into your office as a little girl to follow up on some outstanding obligations. And the next thing you called the general manager then, Mr. Engineer Katwilem, so he called me to tell me, why did you go to the minister? I said, sir, I was doing my job, and that is part of what I'm supposed to do. So during your discussion, one thing you said is that you shouldn't actually ask her why she came to me. That lady, that young girl is brave, and you should actually promote her instead. That was my first interface with you. But it's a pleasure being here at this ninth uh, Mineral World Conference. And just to indicate that the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development has a responsibility and a mission to develop and generally regulate the mineral sector so as to contribute to the socioeconomic development of this country. You cannot move into regulating a sector without the necessary policies and the necessary legal frameworks in place. We are happy that Uganda as a country has had the necessary regulations. We have the Minerals and Mining Policy 2018. We've had others before, the latest is 2018. We have the Mining Act 2003 and other regulations in, in place. And therefore, our focus is to ensure that we have an organized mining sector. I'm privileged to have grown up in Kilembe Mines, and I knew how things were working at that time. There was a lot of, I grew up seeing an organized uh, mine, the Kilembe Mines, with so many, of course, workers. And unfortunately, years after, Kilembe Mines you know, collapsed. I'm now in the sector, and as you rightly said, we are now looking for an investor to really revamp these um, mines so that the country can be able to benefit from its natural resources. Uganda, as a country, we are blessed to have various minerals. You've talked about some of them, the gold, tungsten, the limestone, of course, the phosphates, and so many others, the vermiculite, tin, iron ore, the marble in Karamoja region. And we are happy that we have also undertaken the geophysical surveys and the mapping, and we clearly know what is where. 80% of the country has actually, we've actually undertaken this survey. We are now left with... Um, uh, doing this in the Karamoja region, and we hope that very soon we should be able to have this survey launched, and then we are able, we'll be able to update the country accordingly. Generally, you all know that um, for a country to be able to industrialize, it must really base on its raw material base. With these minerals that we have, the minerals can actually form the raw material base for industrialization in this country. Unfortunately, our focus as a country has been mainly, we've been talking so much about the oil and gas. We've been so much focusing on agricultural produce. While we have all this huge potential of the minerals that has not been actually explored. So this should be now government's focus, or this is now government's focus, no. to ensure that we... I just wanted to emphasize that point uh, in terms of priority. In terms of, do you, are you confident now as the Minister of State for Minerals that the mineral sector is top priority compared with oil and gas? Is that, is, uh, can we go home with that confidence? Certainly, yes, because the huge potential that we have, all that we need to do is to invest in this sector have the necessary human resources in place, have the necessary 
infrastructure in place and will be home and dry. Actually, the mineral sector would fetch much more than we hope to even fetch in the oil and gas sector. If only we can put the necessary investments in place. And we are actually now moving towards that direction. With the support of His Excellency the President, we should be able to really see this sector up and running and employing a huge number of Ugandans. Currently, we are talking of people being employed in this sector, but most of them are the artisanal and small-scale miners, which, as you know, the current existing law does not really uh, cover them. So this is why we, have, we are coming in to have a stronger mining and minerals bill 2020. Very soon we should be able to table this before cabinet so that we can have this strong leg legislation in place and move this sector forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll ca come back to you. We tend to be interactive. It's not, no, it's not one person speaking for a long time. We'll be having a series. Uh, let me get down to my next neighbor here, Emmanuel Ario. Uh, he's representing General Saleh from uh, uh, the OWC, uh, Wealth Creation. This is an exciting, high sounding terminology. <laughs> and I hope uh, you can reassure the audience uh, that uh, once uh, mineral wealth creation is, is part of the game, you, you will make sure you make an impact. Now, we understand you are active with the artisanal miners. How strategic are you and what, how are you going to make sure that the artisanal miners are equipped and they play a more meaningful role? And at the end of the day, Uganda benefits. You have the floor, Emmanuel. My name is Joe Ewaku Emmanuel. I'm the direct investment. I'm the direct investment. The direct investment. Operation wealth creation. Lawyer by. So uh, I'm representing my boss. Okay, so okay. Yes, I said I'm representing my boss, General Salim Saleh. Uh, the Chief Coordinator of Operation Wealth Creation, and he is also the Senior Presidential Advisor on Defense and Security in the country. Now, I want to tell you that Operation Wealth Creation is a linkage. We do a lot of things to link the various government agencies, departments, and the commissions to ensure that government programs succeed. And they must succeed in a way that the household incomes of Ugandans rises, but in a coordinated manner. We have been very active, my boss, General Saleh, has been very active with various mining groups and the artisans, uh, artisans and small-scale miners all over the country. They have been expressing their views to us, telling us their various problems, and they think that they are operating outside. They are operating outside, and they need to operate inside. And uh, when we are meeting them, they have a lot of problems. And I think if we address, if the ministry addresses these problems, the artisan miners, and the small-scale miners can play a very big role in this country. Some of the issues they raise are these. They have problems in licensing. They operate in a way that uh, many of them, the areas where they operate, there is the, the, the licensee is different, and they are operating under this, uh, within that area and they are not recognized 
they are always subject to being evicted. And then even those who want to acquire lenses suffer a lot to get these lenses. The, 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 the process of getting lenses is very, very hard for them. Then they have also have a problem even when those others get lenses, they go on the ground, they end up having, most of these mines are in the forest areas or others and areas of Uganda Wildlife Authority. They have new problems there, they get problems there. Even on the ground, they complain of having problems with the mine police. There is a police unit to deal with mines. They have a lot of problems with mine police. And so, their main agitation has been they want to be organized and to play more formal role in social economic social and economic development of this country. And to do this, we've been organizing them to form big associations so that their voice can be heard and their rights are respected. And there are very many issues on the ground if the ministry could pay attention to like in the areas where they operate, they are, first of all, like those in the gold area. They don't want, they think using mercury is very dangerous. They think there is need for alternative, uh, alternative means of processing gold. Then they have uh, problems to do with the, even where uh, miners, they know there's a, min, a, min, a mineral here to be exploited. The government does not come forward, provide safety, has, uh, safety measures for them. And the conditions in these mine areas are actually bad. Thank you. Uh, Emmanuel, yes. we, are, we are time constrained, but uh, could you just indicate, uh, as you deal with the Titano miners, how do you make sure you, uh, you work hand in hand with the ministry so that there is a, co a comprehensive, cohesive approach that at the end of the day will benefit artisanal miners. You've mentioned, for example, mineral police. There have been a lot of complaints and uncoordinated efforts. How do you make sure these, you are together? In just one sentence so that we can move to the next speaker. Yes, we had, we had a, a meeting some time back and all WC headquarters, which brought together uh, Minister of Energy, Directorate of uh, Mines and Surveys, NFA, uh, UDA, uh, 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 Uganda Wildlife Authority, and the police, Uganda Police Force. This issue was brought, and the police assured us that, that because the, the, the artisan miners were saying, what is supposed to be mine po mineral police on the ground is mining police. Okay. And so that attitude, the police have assured us it will change. It Thank will not happen again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move on to uh, our friend again. There is a distinguished lawyer that uh, has been dealing with the mining sector for some time. Now, maybe you will help our audience by. Uh, Uh, the processes involved in adding value. Because more often than not, people talk about the value addition of minerals when you have no minerals to add value. Mm -hmm. So, can you take us through this process and what sort of challenges do you see in uh, achieving that goal? Uh, Dennis. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dennis Kusasi. I'm uh, a lawyer by profession and I focus mainly on uh, natural resources law. So I have a fair understanding somehow of uh, how this industry operates. I agree with the professor and the minister that indeed min minerals can be the foundation for industrialization if uh, they are properly handled. We've seen this happening in countries like uh, you know, Sweden, Finland, uh, Chile, United States, Norway and uh, Botswana in Africa, South Africa. And also we've seen it happening in countries that don't necessarily produce minerals, but import them, like Japan and Korea. However, in order for us to 
really discuss the point of value addition, I think it's very important to understand, as Professor and Minister both pointed out, that the foundation for value addition in the mining sector are the minerals themselves. So can we talk about value addition before we can establish that we have got sufficient quantities of minerals of the right quality on which value can be added? I think we can't do that in view of uh, what the pre previous speakers have said. To put this discussion in context, I think I can state the following facts. In uh, 2006, the government launched uh, an aeromagnetic uh, geophysical survey where the whole country was uh, surveyed. I think 80% of the country was surveyed. And uh, the information that came out of that survey was interpreted and mapped. And uh, as a result, about, if I am, I, I, I remember very well, 18 mineral potential targets were identified for further exploration. And uh, we saw that between 2009 and 2011, there was uh, a marked increase in the number of investors expressing interest to uh, undertake projects in Uganda. But then that, that uh, process dropped off when the mining sector faced global challenges between 2012 up to date when uh, exploration investment capital dropped because of various global problems like uh, declining prices of mineral commodities. And what have we done for ourselves in Uganda is uh, instead of uh, continuing with the systematic approach, we've surveyed the country, we've identified, we have mapped, we have uh, evaluated the information that we got, we have uh, identified the targets, what have we done next? We've jumped and began discussing value addition, production sharing, which I think is a, a premature discussion in my view. The next steps actually was to make sure that the targets that have been identified are evaluated to define the resource in those areas. And then after that, we define the reserves. After that, we do a complete feasibility studies on those areas to find out whether in view of existing technology, uh, infrastructure and prices of mineral commodities, those minerals can be profitably mined. We didn't do that. We have rushed into this discussion of value addition before we have found out whether we have enough reserves on which value can be added. Uh, I think it's similar to the proverbial saying of hunters where, who are you know, discussing how to share the you know, the, the meat before they have actually hunted down the animal. So I think we need to go back to the basics, go back to the systematic process that we had started. Value addition is a very good thing to talk about. As I've said, it can spur growth, industrialization of a country through, you know, forward and backward linkages, but it cannot happen without minerals existing in the right quantities of the right, right quality, and when we say right quantities and right quality, we mean the minerals themselves that in raw materials for value addition, if you talk about iron ore, it must exist in the right quantity, in the sufficient quantities, and also in uh, the right, of the right quality. And then on top of that, you have the complementary inputs. If you talk about iron ore, you must also have coal or gas, at least. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, I think, Dennis, you have pointed out a very important point, and I'm glad that the Honourable Minister is listening, putting the cart before the horse. In other words, yes, we are talking about mineral variation, but are we talking about a goal that we should work toward, or we are talking about adding value, thinking that we have something to add? This is a critical question. And so, as the government even thinks about new legislation, we should be mindful of we should not uh, copy and paste uh, things that we have seen in the oil sector. In the, in the, in the oil sector, uh, we should not copy and paste like production sharing agreement. So, Honorable Minister, uh, on second round, if I may, uh, 
I, 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 I want you to have a go uh, because time is limited. Uh, in terms of, of, of assuring the, the audience, in terms of priority, in terms of identifying which minerals you think we, the country may add value to and those that may have to wait. Because at the end of the day, you can only add value if it makes economic and financial sense. Honorable Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I want to reassure the listeners that the government is committed to ensuring that its vision 2040 is attained and one of the sectors that the government is actually looking at is the minerals sector. Currently, as you know, there is a ban on export on some of the strategic minerals. You cannot export raw gold. You cannot export iron ore, copper, tin, tungsten, and all these are because we believe that value can be added to these strategic minerals. And the whole reason behind all this is because when you export our raw minerals, we lose out on various opportunities like increased revenue for the government, we lose out on employment creation, and of course, ultimately lose out on the, the industrialization that we all yearn for. You said... Minister, yes. Uh, without, uh, you'll excuse me, if you listen to Dennis, nobody is saying the country should not have very addition, but the point is where we are as a country. For example, if you have not got what it takes in terms of quantity and volumes and what type of mineral, and do you stop and put their ban, or the ban can be counterproductive in terms of promoting the goal that the country is aiming at? Uh, that's what I I was you. getting to that point yes. by taking you through. We miss, I was talking about the missing out on the industrialization. And of course, you have heard time and again, and even this conference is intended to attract investments into the country. We are putting out our mineral potential so that people out there know what we have as a country so that they can come in and invest. So this is the whole reason. Uh, of course, the ban is intended to achieve that. We know that once we, with, a, uh, with, with an excellent legal regime, with the security guaranteed in the country, and a good investment climate, we should be able to attract investments in the country. If Rwanda, Tanzania, DRC can attract these investments, why not us as a country, as Uganda? We've been hearing about the ban is resulting into, for instance, uh, smuggling of the raw materials to other countries, but why do those other neighboring countries have these industries and we don't have them? So our focus really is to ensure that we attract the investments into the investors into the country so that they can invest in these sectors, specifically targeting the strategic minerals, and we should be able to definitely thereafter achieve the social economic transformation that we all yearn for. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, It's okay. So, one is a, the production sharing agreement suits the oil sector, but then when it comes to 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 the minerals, you have not known the exact quantity of the mineral you are talking about. You are discussing production sharing agreement and. 
Whereas in oil, it's very easy to know the quantity of oil is there, and when it comes really highly doubted, it's very hard when it comes to the minerals. I think this issue should be, should be seriously addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Back to... Yeah, back to you. But uh, uh, listening in our discussion. Uh, sorry. Uh, listening in, if you, you've uh, followed the discussion we've had this morning, <coughs> you've talked about constraints, you've talked about, and yet the mission of this conference is to make sure that we really attract very many players, both Ugandans and international investors, so that we can focus on the available potential to run them through those processes you have talked about. Mm -hmm. But to get exploration capital is very difficult. Countries are competing for this money. How do we, as Uganda, given these constraints, what magic can fast track the process? Dennis? Yeah, I think uh, first is to take a step back and um, Remember that this is uh, development of minerals is a systematic process. You can't uh, jump from one stage to another. It's a sequential and systematic process, each process leading to the other. Um, we need to focus on how to attract investment in the exploration uh, phase, ex uh, exploration uh, sector, and to do that, we don't need to scare away these investors. Even with the, 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 the debate on value addition, which is all good, has good intentions, and the ban also was also for good intentions, but the timing of it was wrong. And I think the manner in which it was done uh, has done more damage because, I mean, people had mining leases, and these were suspended arbitrarily without uh, hearing them. That scared away even the people who could have invested in the exploration. So if we can solve this and be systematic, we can uh, get there to value addition. Okay. How do we get there? We can use private sector money. But if private sector won't come, it means they are not yet convinced with the uh, with geological perspective of our country. So government has to do more beyond just uh, the occurrences that are displayed. They can, for example, start by doing a little bit more work in, the, in, in those targets uh, yeah. than, than what we have now. Uh, thank you very much. I'm coming back. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, um, am I on? Thank you, Dennis, uh, for uh, your valuable contribution. Now, I want to give an opportunity to each of you as panelists to give the last word. In other words, having discussed this topic, what is your takeaway? What do you leave the audience with? If I might start, uh, uh, you, you, uh, I wanted to end with you, Honorable Minister, if you don't mind, uh, so that uh, you can have the last one. Let me start with Professor Wesley. Just uh, in one second. Uh, that's not enough. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, they say uh, in business, you, get, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. So how are we negotiating with these uh, investors? But we must understand that we must protect our interests. Yes. There are a lot of things where we can actually uh, make it possible for the indigenous people to do some of this work. Yeah. Thank you Secondly, very much. Secondly, uh, I also live by example. Look at a small country like Trinidad and Tobago. They have done very well with their oil and gas to the point that they can afford to import iron ore from Brazil to make steel. We have our own iron ore. We know what it takes to value add to that iron ore. Let us address those issues and, uh, and really empower the indigenous entrepreneurs, indigenous uh, scientists thank you. Thank you. to do this work. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. I think it is important 
The point you make is that as as we have these plans, we should really make sure that Ugandans are involved so that they are not on lookers as we have these plans. I think it's a very critical point. Now, Emmanuel, what is your last word vis-à-vis uh, -vis making sure? It's not just talking about mineral, uh, mineral wealth creation in isolation to get minerals at the center. What is your last word? Mine is that we, we need to organize our, ourselves, our own people. The, the small-scale mine, mining groups should be organized associations, probably cooperatives. By the time the investors come to this country, they should find there is an organized group and easy to work with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dennis, you are taking away for, uh, after yeah. today's discussion. Yeah, maybe I just want to say that uh, to give courage, I mean, uh, hope, the, the, the prospectivity of Uganda's uh, mineral uh, sector is, is not in doubt, uh, given that mining is taking place in all our neighboring countries, Congo, and uh, I mean, DRC and Tanzania, and uh, to an extent in Kenya. All we need to do is to be systematic. Thank you. Now, last word from Honorable Minister, because you, critical involvement of Ugandans, uh, and also making sure that Uganda is not an island in terms of attracting investors. How do we create this enabling environment so that it's a win-win situation and we get the sector at the center stage in transforming Uganda's social economic uh, welfare of our people? Uh, thank you very much. The win-win, as I said before, starts with the policies and the legislation, and this is why we are revising the current Mining Act 2003. It will address the issues that uh, the gentleman from Operation Wealth Creation has talked about, the issue of the, of the Atsano and small-scale miners, but we also have to really ensure that these Atsano and small-scale miners are organized they should apply because we have an online system and already we have at Sun and Small Sky Miners Associations that we have given licenses. Let us get away. In order for us to really promote investments in this sector, we should ensure that those who have got, gotten their licenses in particular areas are protected because we shouldn't encourage indiscipline in the sector. And this is something that I have seen. People going in saying because we are Ugandans, we should go and take over. That should not happen. Let their sun and small-scale miners organize themselves into associations, we should be, and we should be able to give them their own licenses in particular areas. But also, I want to comment about the issue of the ban and, of course, the production sharing agreement. The issue of the ban is actually still a cabinet uh, discussion, and we hope that we should be able to resolve that challenge. We are aware that People already had their licenses, some were already operating, and the ban affected them. So it's not an issue that I will say with finality that we have. Yes, the ban was there, but a discussion is going on uh, to see how to resolve the issue. And then lastly, the issue of the production sharing agreement. I think we are not saying that every license holder, every mine every uh, company involved in mining, the government should have a stake there. We all know that in the mining sector, we require a lot of resources. And this is why you find that we do not have yet so many Ugandans in this sector because it requires huge resources at exploration, which most people don't have. And of course, even at the mining level, you need resources to be able to invest in the necessary equipment and also the necessary skills and expertise we don't have as a country. And that's why we are coming with this production sharing government in the new bill to cater for that. There are countries that have done this, but it won't be in every, you know, every you know, mineral or every mine that government will have a stake there. There are sp specific strategic areas that government feels it Thank must you. have a stake in. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Now, uh, I think that's an interesting conversation we shall carry on. My final comment as a, a moderator, I'm winding up because time is really up. Uh, uh, the following takeaways, one,
that Uganda must prioritize mineral sector at the center stage uh, if we are going to transform our economy, our economy and focus on, on industrialization, select those critical uh, minerals where it makes financial and economic sense to add value, uh, focus on the minerals of the future uh, that we talked about, uh, enabling infrastructure and get claim off the ground. Let's not just talk about it, let's act. Uh, definitely this blanket mineral ban is a discussion we must have in honesty and make sure uh, we make Uganda an attractive uh, investment destination. Have accredited lab, because this business of carrying samples uh, all over the world uh, doesn't augur well for the sector. Finally, as we address legislation, let us be let us engage meaningfully and not just legislate for the sake of legislating because we could easily shoot ourselves in the foot if we are not careful. Let me uh, conclude by th thanking our distinguished panelists. Without you, we wouldn't have had such an exciting discussion. Being the first panel, I hope we have set the, the ball rolling. And uh, my next duty is to invite you to uh, receive an address by the, our guest of honor, UND, uh, UNDP resident representative Els Atapua. Uh, I'm told uh, we shall be addressing him straight on the screen uh, from her office. You are welcome. His Excellency Yewari Kaguta Museveni, President of the Republic of Uganda, Honorable Minister of State for Mineral Development, Honorable Sarah Opendi, officials of the Government of Uganda, the Chairman of Uganda Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, members of the private sector, civil society representatives, development partners, colleagues from the United Nations system, distinguished guests and viewers. On behalf of the United Nations Development Program, and indeed our larger United Nations family, I'm delighted to join you today at this ninth Mineral Wealth Conference. Allow me to begin by congratulating Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, on the occasion of the 58th Independence Anniversary. Let me also take this opportunity to extend hearty congratulations to the government and the people of Uganda upon joining the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, a global standard to promote the open and accountable management of oil, gas, and mineral resources. I thank the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development and the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum for organizing this Mineral Wealth Conference amidst the challenging and unprecedented times we are faced with in this COVID era. The conference provides us with a platform to foster dialogue and build awareness on how the extractive industry can contribute to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. This dialogue is also timely as we start the implementation of the third National Development Plan and discuss post-COVID-19 recovery and resilience building, including the future of mining. Distinguished stakeholders and viewers, Uganda is endowed with favorable geological environments that host a vast range of mineral deposits, including gold, iron ore, phosphates, and development minerals, such as clay, gravel, and granite, amongst others. The volume of minerals and metals extracted from the earth has also grown exponentially in the last decade, with the contribution of mining to gross domestic product, GDP, increasing from 0.3% in the fiscal year 2012-2013 to 0.7% in the fiscal year 2018-2019. The sector also employs a significant number of youth and women. This is particularly so in the development minerals, which is a sector in which we find minerals and materials that are mined, processed, and manufactured and used domestically in industries such as agriculture, construction, and manufacturing. <clears throat> development minerals employ an estimated 400,000 Ugandans, with women constituting 44% of the workforce. 
The subsector also contributes about $350 million in production value to Uganda's GDP. Development minerals also have a potential to offset Uganda's trade deficit by 3.5% if their value chains are optimized. The exploitation of mineral resources can therefore bring great benefits, including creating decent jobs, generating increased physical revenues, and sparing innovation and accelerating the country's progress towards the attainment of the NDP3, Vision 2040, and the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly SDG1 on eliminating poverty, SDG5 on gender equality, and SDG9 on industry, innovation, and infrastructure, amongst others. I commend the government of Uganda for recognizing and developing a program in the recently approved third national development plan to tap into this potential. I also applaud the efforts of the government too, with the support of UNDP, streamline the regulatory framework for mineral development, particularly updating the Min Mining and Minerals Policy 2018, gazetting the 2019 Mining Regulations 2019 to facilitate electronic governance of mineral resources, and enacting the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region Act 2017. Distinguished stakeholders and viewers, with resource extraction expected to grow in the foreseeable future, we must do more to ensure that these vast yet untapped mineral resources benefit all citizens and drive human development. We must always keep in mind that mineral resources are finite and will at one point be depleted or not be economically viable for extraction. Therefore, it is critical for Uganda to maximize its mineral wealth to its fullest while the opportunity still remains. It is also important to maximize this potential in order to reduce and manage risk associated with dependence on natural resources that may become stranded as a result of potential shifts in international financial and political economy processes, greening and decarbonization. This will require that we collectively look at a number of imperatives to achieve the development goals of the country, of the country through our mineral wealth. Notably, and I want to highlight a few points here, ensuring the alignment of the domestic policies with the African mining vision of the African Union Commission. The African mining vision seeks to promote equitable, broad-based development through the prudent utilization of the continent's natural wealth. Secondly, providing the necessary technical skills to support contract negotiations so that the country can benefit from higher rents from its commodities. Again, strengthening benefit sharing mechanisms for shared resources. This is one of the ways to promote wealth creation and to ensure that the principle of leaving no one behind as espoused in the Sustainable Development Goals and the NDP goal, NDP3 goal of increasing average household incomes and improving the quality of life of Ugandans are achieved. I also want to say that we have to collectively work together to combat illicit financial flows and promoting effective taxation mechanisms and regulatory frameworks. In addition, we must address the issue of wasteful mining. Mining efforts, whether small, medium, or large scale, must be undertaken in a well thought out manner that optimizes the value and market of these minerals. We must therefore invest and facilitate access to the appropriate technologies, markets, as well as affordable and adequate financing and investments to ensure that supply and value chains are well developed and elaborated to widen the opportunity baskets for fellow Ugandans. In line with the above mentioned, I'm happy to say that the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, within the framework of NDP3 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, which has been recently approved, and UNDP's own five-year country program will support the following initiatives. First, UNDP will support integration of climate change and biodiversity considerations, environmental protection measures, and how emission standards can be integrated into policy frameworks. This is very important to ensure that we can also balance the trade-offs as we mine. 
In collaboration with key stakeholders and partners, UNDP will support offsetting of the negative impact on ecosystems, livelihoods, and the atmosphere, for instance, oil spills, mineral pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, environmental rehabilitation measures to increase ecosystem resilience and protect biodiversity, and the undertaking of gender-sensitive conflict risk analysis to identify drivers of conflicts, capacities for conflict resolution, and existing traditional and non-traditional dispute resolution mechanisms. Second, we will promote people-centered exploration and extraction through strengthening oversight capacity and responsibilities of parliament, civil society, and the media, as well as building capacities for policy implementation, monitoring and enforcement of legal and regulatory frameworks. In line with this, I would like to acknowledge the African Caribbean Pacific ACP and the European Union for supporting efforts to build the profile of development minerals in six African countries, including Uganda. In Uganda, the government, of, uh, the government and UNDP are partnering with a number of stakeholders to strengthen the capacity of artisanal and small-scale miners. Third, UNDP, together with our UN family, will facilitate knowledge exchange through South-to-South -South cooperation, focusing on best practices in translating mineral wealth into growth and development, such as we see in, in Botswana, which is the world's largest producer of diamonds by value. Botswana has set up mechanisms to ensure that a significant part of its mineral resource revenue is allocated for investment in health and education. It also invests a portion of its mineral wealth in its Pula Fund, which serves as a buffer against price volatility and preserves a share of the rents from diamond exports for future generations. Fourth, we would foster forward and backward linkages with a local economy focusing on tra technology transfer to and integrating local enterprises owned and operated by women and men. UNDP will broker partnerships with entities such as the African Guarantee Fund for small and medium enterprises to avail financing and access to appropriate technologies necessary to enhance the participation and competitiveness of local enterprises in the various mineral value chains. I wish to share that UNDP has supported efforts towards inclusive financing of the mining sector as well as training of many, many sectors, many uh, businesses uh, to formalize their work and to also grow. I also affirm UNDP's commitment to support Uganda to position itself within the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement to strengthen regional trade activity as well as harness collaboration for mutual growth. So in essence, in the spirit of South to South cooperation, again, this is where we are going to play an active role to support the government and the people of Uganda. Fifth, UNDP has supported business continuity of government through the provision of virtual collaboration tools such as Zoom, as well as assortment of information, communication, and technology gadgets to enable government to function virtually and to continue operations in several ministries, departments, and agencies during the lockdown period. UNDP also, in partnership with Jumia, launched an e-platform, e-commerce platform to sustain supply chains for micro, small, and medium-scale enterprises and to connect them with consumers online for the very first time. We will therefore develop a, or adapt a similar platform to support artisanal and small miners, the Juakalis, as a mechanism to enhance their competitiveness and connect them with consumers online. Distinguished guests and viewers, as I conclude, I must emphasize that at UNDP, we view a large endowment of hydrocarbons and minerals as an opportunity to transform development prospects if they are managed in a transparent, inclusive, and sustainable way, and their proceeds are fairly distributed. I reiterate UNDP's commitment to partner with the government, private sector, civil society, academia, and the media in ensuring that the country's mineral wealth contributes to sustainable economic and social development as we discuss the future of mining. I would like to thank the government of Uganda and the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum once again for co-hosting this conference and for the close relationship with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, 
and by extension, the United Nations family. We have been partners for several years, and we look forward to continuing and strengthening our cooperation and partnership for many years to come. I wish us all very fruitful deliberations. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, good morning and welcome back to the studio. My name is uh, Ashawa, Ashawa Agre, and I'll be your host for the next one hour as we discuss the second session of uh, the ninth uh, Mineral Wealth Conference organized by the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. Um, with me, I have uh, four distinguished panelists, uh, one of which is uh, Dr. Frank Mujeni, who has extensive uh, experience both from uh, COMESA, the African Union, and recently with the Mining Africa Development Institute, who will be sharing with us the broader perspective of uh, the session that is going to cover uh, the drivers to mineral value chains uh, for the country. I will also have uh, uh, Ms. Hope Charisima, who is from UNDP, but she'll be on a live unit from her office that she'll be joining us. And I have with me on my second left, uh, Ms. Dr. Abraham Mwanguzi from the National Planning Authority, uh, who will be speaking to us about uh, iron and steel industry. And lastly, we'll have uh, Mr. Michael Rodriguez from Javois Mining, who will be joining us via Zoom from Australia. Um, and with them, obviously, as you can see here, we have uh, three different minerals, uh, developmental minerals, the iron ore, and uh, the cobalt. And we'll be discussing how the mineral value chains affect each of these development minerals and what it means for a country like Uganda and where we need to focus. Uh, so diving right through this, um, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Frank Mujeni, who is ex immediately on my left. Uh, through his own experience across the different mining jurisdictions, to share with us bri briefly, in about five minutes, uh, what does he think are the drivers of the critical requirements for a successful mineral additions value chain? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, distinguished delegates, honorable minister, and all that are viewing us from all over the world. <clears throat> uh, the last panel has actually done my work a bit easier because they have all recognized that the mineral resource are the key to economic development. And that starts my own, because we have, as Africa, we've been focusing on other sectors, agriculture and others. But you don't understand that even agriculture itself needs mineral resources. And I'm glad I've heard that Uganda is investing in, in, in phosphates. But let me first go to where I wanted to start, that Africa needs to have a, mind, a change of mindset. And we all sat here hearing whether can we add value or not add value. The question is not whether we can or if we can. The, question, the point is we as Africa must add value to our resources. But where is the starting point? The starting point is understanding, and it was also a good thing to have a, an opening session with talking about contribution of mineral resources to industrialization. And if you look back into our forefathers' initiatives at the African Union and continental and at the sub-regional level, in some of the writings, you'll never find the word mining. In fact, when I start with the Lagos Plan of Action, you'll find that they are only talking about metallurgical industries, petrochemical industries, uh, fertilizer, energy industries. So we, as Africa, has, uh, we inherited the issue of mining and it has lived with us. Mining is an act, is, is a segment of the value chain. So we need to understand the value chain. And value addition of, uh, takes place at every level of the value chain. Let me start with, with, with geological information and exploration. Everybody ac accepts that we need more information. We need to know what we have, because as Africa, we don't even know what we have. Before you add value, you must have to know what you have in real sense, in economic terms. We've heard that production sharing agreement only ap applies in petroleum because they know what is there. But mineral resource classification, it will be spoken about here later on. You have to know what you have in other mineral resources. Yet, even petroleum and gas are also mineral resources for, the, for energy. 
So we can't speak about mineral resources in abstract. We have to have a holistic approach. So in terms of where do we start, we have to have a mindset of going back to the drawing boards and knowing that value addition is, requires a robust industrial base. And the industrial base, a robust industrial base, cannot be at a country level. Uganda is a, is a, is a population, has a population of 45 million or so, or 42. And you're talking about China, which has the robust industrial base that has created a, a, a demand for our resources with 1.3 billion people of their population. And Africa has 1.3 billion people with 30 million square kilometers. And China is only 9 point something, 9 square kilometers, million square kilometers. So where, where do we put our, our calculation? If you want to have an, a strong industrial base to create demand for the resources at every level of the value chain, you need to have to talk about regional bases because mineral resources don't have borders. We have these dotted lines and we want to think about Uganda adding value, Tanzania adding value, the DRC adding value, yet we all have the same mineral resources and we do not have a regional economic base or a regional economic zone for, for adding value, a metallurgical industry. We've had the Industrial Research Institute setting up the first uh, metallurgical base in Nama Industrial Park. We need a, a regional base to, to do that. Now, we need to understand that mineral resources, as already alluded to by the first uh, uh, panel, is the backbone of the economy, as I've already said. And we need to start look, going away from thinking global and acting local. For mineral resources, our heads of state meet in all these uh, uh, sessions where they meet at sub-regional level and at continental level, and they discuss and they agree. And in 2009, they appended their signature on um, Africa mining vision. And it talks about downstream beneficiation, upstream beneficiation, sidestream linkages, and understanding and having a knowledge of your resources. But how to get there is the problem. The Abuja Treaty doesn't have any word like mining. It only lists priority industries, agro industries. It doesn't even talk about agriculture. It talks about agro industries. It talks about metallurgical, petrochemical, and so forth. And all these, when you look at them, they all require mineral resources. Now, value chain is a new phenomenon that we have taken in, 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 in abstract. Value chain is a new process. As we used to have industrial revolution, as Charles alluded to, uh, which was based on production line. The value chain, value addition, is based on production processes. You produce intermediate goods for another industry. The 70% of international trade, global trade, 70%, is based on intermediary goods. So value chain, and even when we, we move into discussing rules of origin at the East African level, at the continental level, we talk about how do you add value incrementally to produce a regional value chain, a good that is made in East Africa, under the East African community, under COMESA, under African Union. We have buy Uganda, build Uganda. Why don't have we buy Africa, build Africa? because we are talking about 1.3 billion people in gross market. So we need to move from thinking local, we need to act local, from thinking global and act local, but thinking global, acting global, because we are in the global village. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to, to allude to the fact that when you look at our resources, what, how much do we know as Uganda, if we wanted to attract investments, and attracting investment and looking at mining as the, as, the, as the investment attraction is also not helping us because we're not looking at industrialization that were being made. But investments are there, second generational investments that can go into value addition from, from geological information. Geological information needs to be value added too. When you collect it, when you do uh, exploration, you need geochemists, you need geophysicists, you need uh, capital goods. Capital goods are made from uh, mineral, mineral resources. So, in terms of our adding value, we need to understand as Africa, where do we start from? Do we start from upstream beneficiation, which has to develop all these industries that contribute to supplying the mineral resource sector as a value chain? The up, upstream beneficiation would include, include some light engineering industries, which also are, are based on uh, our, our mineral resources. If you need to produce uh, bolts and nuts, for, 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 our, for the capital goods, 
as our Katwe, our, our Jiwakalis used to do. Right now, they are importing uh, second-hand recycled uh, machinery, but it used to be a factory for metallurgical, and it has died out. You don't hear anything that is, is, is hitting machines on steels and so forth. But these steel need iron ore. This, this uh, aluminium, we need the bauxite. Uh, we need, uh, uh, we need uh, copper for, 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 for electronic cable. We need every mineral resource to feed even our upstream beneficiation. But the whole thank, point thank is you. to talk, to think uh, regional before we move into uh, thinking that we can do a whole integrated value chain uh, into one country. Thank we you, need Frank. to look at the global, at the integration. Thank you, Frank, for painting um, the value chain with a very broad brush. But um, I would like probably to now move down to the actual minerals, into the development of minerals. I'm not sure if um, Hope is with us, because she's having a live unit, because I wanted her to... Um, yes, Hope, can you hear us? Yes, Hope, if you can hear us, uh, I'd like to pose to you. Hope is the uh, co country coordinator for the SCPEU Development Minerals Program. I just wanted her to build up from what Frank has just highlighted broadly and what uh, she can uh, tell the country on what developmental minerals are and what type of beneficiation or value addition has been provided to the development of minerals. Hope, if you're with us, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, fellow panelists and uh, viewers. Uh, so when we said development minerals, like you just heard from the resident representative of UNDP, we are basically talking about uh, minerals and materials that are mined and utilized within the domestic economy, that is Uganda for in this instance. And of course, examples to delve a bit into that uh, include construction materials, when you talk of sand and stone aggregate, uh, you look at uh, dimension stones such, and, such as marble and granite, and of course you look at minerals used in industrial processes such as limestone, salt, and bentonite clays. But of course also these decorative and fashionable semi-precious stones. So basically when you look at development minerals from the examples I've just shared, you realize that most of these minerals and materials are very intrinsic to our domestic life and national infrastructure, and of course they are distributed throughout the country. I'm sure any Uganda, no anyone familiar with our landscape has seen quarries, has seen where they mine salt, the, li the limestone and uh, other materials like that. And of course, these are also inputs into a lot of the housing construction going on, a lot of the fertilizers that we manufacture and export and produce here. But also, also you might be interested to know that even your toothpaste itself contains uh, these development minerals. Um, um, so that's what basically I can talk about that in terms of what they are and how they are actually positioned within the country. And in terms of prospects in, uh, for adding value, I would like to draw our attention to our baseline study that we did for Uganda, which was published in 2018. And this study was really about assessing what this sector looks like because we realized there was limited data in terms of the profile of this sector, where are these minerals and materials, what is the economic potential and viability, but also critically, what are the opportunities along the value chains as we are discussing, because not everything can be extracted and utilized economically. So part of that study, of course, is all, it, all of it is online. Feel free to really look it out on our websites, and uh, we really put it out as a resource for stakeholders within the public and private sector to really get a hold of this good resource, because it's good research and actually be able to delve into it and derive some good actions. So in terms of potential, you look at the issues around development minerals, for example, in terms of figures. We found that uh, these development minerals, if they were really captured in our national economic statistics, actually, you would be interested to know that our GDP, for instance, would really increase to one point by 1.3%. 1 but these are not captured because of what we shall also discuss later on. And of course, when we look at the full value chains, if they are really considered, let's say from the clay bricks, the sand, the stone aggregate, and dimension stones, the total value of it actually includes uh, up to a tune of 6.5% of our GDP is derived from this sector when you optimize these value chains, meaning that you're extracting right and selling and producing at economic value. 
Then, of course, also we look at development minerals in terms of our import substitution. Most of what we are doing, we have discovered in our research that uh, they are also having a good potential of making sure that we reduce Uganda's trade deficit by 3.5%. What I'm trying to say is that, for example, we find that reliance on the import of many of these development minerals and their products have made us actually uh, incur a trade deficit of 3.2% meaning that if we're actually optimizing value domestically within Uganda, we would save much of our import bill, and that money would actually be trickling down to the domestic economy and our producers and miners. And of course, there are so many opportunities for these artisan and small-scale miners and producers, the small-scale enterprises. And of course, you find that there are good opportunities for people who have invested well in ceramics, in cement, in salt, and of course, the lime products that are used a lot in our cement production. So the opportunities are there in terms of really adding value and making uh, good earnings as a country. So what we are trying to demonstrate is that uh, Uganda is well endowed with these minerals and materials, but uh, we find that the extraction, processing, and marketing is at very small scale so far, and of course with very limited value addition. And what is that one is making us do is, of course, lose out in terms of the economic benefit, but also we are unnecessarily spending so much in importing products that would actually be able to uh, produce here if we really put in the right efforts and uh, partnerships. And of course, I uh, wanted to highlight more that three critical issues would come to mind if we are discussing value addition for development minerals. One, there is a great use of rudimentary technologies. If you look around you, people are using archaic or substandard or minimal mechanization in extracting these minerals and materials. That affects the quality and the quantity of what they are mining and selling. Some are doing it because they don't, like, they don't have the technologies, but others are doing it because they don't know how else to do it. You've got some mines and uh, facilities, and they tell you we've been doing this for hundreds of years, and it's a vicious cycle of wasteful and suboptimal extraction. Also, when you look at the issue of financing, we've been engaging so much with the financial sector because somehow we have to demystify the value chain of these development minerals. When you want to meet a banker, you're a miner, you're an association or business, they're going to ask you where is the business potential, at what point do you break even, what is a profit for a customer margin, and so we realize there is very limited understanding of that, and that has informed a lot of what we've been doing to engage with the financial sector to make sure that people are more aware. And finally, in terms of uh, what we need to do on the issue that is prevailing and creating a bit of a bottleneck, we realize there is very limited value addition, and, it's, and especially in the largely informal and small-scale way of mining. This limits business development because, as we know, if you're not adding value, if you don't have sufficient quantities to make business sense to anyone, you're not going to get the right investment. You will not generate the sufficient capital. You need to invest in technologies appropriate. But also the interconnection between the market and the production is limited because you're largely unknown beyond your local location. So it's really a mix of not being well organized, not well being mapped out in Uganda, but also the need to really move from rudimentary and small-scale extraction into some medium-scale consolidated mining that we need to do. Because one of the biggest opportunities that you find that in Uganda, 6.8% of Ugandans are actually dependent on this sector in terms of the value chains and supply chains and the jobs along the line. Uh, also, you look at uh, 2.5 million Ugandans who actually directly benefit and indirectly on these livelihoods from minerals. When we look at the incomes of, uh, of workers, we found that in our study, for example, these development minerals in terms of the miners, producers, and processors, they really earn almost $170 million annually. This money is being generated and spent within the domestic economy at this small scale. So just imagine if we were better organized, we had the right technology and capital to really grow these businesses. So what we would like to demonstrate and share is that the opportunities are there, the prospects are very good actually, uh, these minerals are everywhere in the country. We just have to make the connection between the right technologies, 
the financing and getting this sector organized in very good, robust associations and business entities that will make it easier to attract investment, market these products, but also equitably compete. You've had an allusion to the regional markets prevailing. That's another opportunity that no one is going to come from another country to trade with you if you're not organized. So with us, what we are going to really be investing in, and we've been working a lot with the Minister of Energy and, of course, with partners like Chamber, Chamber of Mines, to make sure that at least we get organized and track good, meaningful investments within this sector. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. Thank you for that summary. Um, it's good that you're doing a lot of work with the artisanals and the fact that uh, you're also pushing for the improvement of uh, value at the small and medium enterprise level um, for the different developmental minerals and also to know that the developmental minerals contribute as much as uh, the 25% of GDP, which is fantastic. Uh, but allow me to go to Dr. Abraham Wanguzi from the National Planning Authority who has been uh, the leader of the feasibility study on the integrated iron and steel industry because iron ore has been one of the priority areas of the government for the last couple of years and they have been looking at how they can be able to create an integrated iron and steel industry. But I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Mwanguzi, for the studies that you've done, what have been the key findings in this study and what do you think the country needs to do in terms of uh, the theme of uh, this conference, which is uh, mineral value addition, and what the challenges may be, and what do we need to anticipate going forward? And probably the minister is still in the audience. What do you think government needs to put in place to unlock this potential? Thank you, moderator, uh, honorable minister, distinguished guests, and our viewers. I greet you all. I want to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank the Chamber of Mines for persevering, even in the hardest of times, to see that we have this annual conference so that we can be able to update the general public about the occurrences in the mining, in the extractive sector generally. Now, I will go straight to the point. We know iron and steel is very critical for development. And uh, moderate, it is not just three years, but a number of years. The government has been looking at developing this. So in the study that we carried out to do a comprehensive assessment of developing this industry, uh, among the major findings are many, but I will hi hi summarize. The first one is that there are 16 companies that have been licensed to do exploration, specifically in iron ore, but only one. And this has, this has been for a number of years. Only one has actually gone ahead to do the exploration in its licensed area. That is Sino Minerals. We also found that in the government documents, we quote the iron ore reserves to be standing at around 580 million tons of ore. But this is not bankable in that it cannot attract investment, as earlier alluded to by the previous panel. There, is, there was for no evidence of uh, following uh, internationally recognized procedures in quantifying reserves because people do a lot of uh, quick quantification, so there are international procedures to follow. So there's no evidence to show how this was arrived at. So yes, we have the ore, but we don't know how much. Apart from what was done by this one company, which is 30 million tons, that we can authoritatively quote uh, in our reserves. The rest we need to do, the exploration. The other thing we found that out of the 17 companies in the steel industry, nine do 100% importation of all their raw materials. Uh, seven do 90%. They do scrap recycling of 10%. And then there, is, there are two companies that use 100% scrap. So they source their raw materials locally. But out of these two, one is closed. So there is one which is operating at 100% of these uh, raw material uh, sourcing from in-country. We also found that this kind of the, scrap strokes, the, the scrap stocks are, deep, are getting depleted very fast. Over the last six years, 
the price of scrap has increased by more than 200% because the reserves are being depleted. So we can't, in the medium term, rely on scrap recycling to produce uh, iron and steel. We discovered that there the is installed capacity of 1.5 million tons in steel rolling. The iron uh, value chain has mining, iron making, steel making, and then steel rolling. That is the tail end. So in that tail end, we have 1.5 million, ta million tons per annum capacity, but this is operating at 35% due to a number of reasons. One of it is the high power cost, which is also unstable. Another one is the high transport cost for raw materials because of inefficient transport. And then the market is not sufficient, especially on government infrastructure projects, like the dams, the roads, because most some companies which are contracted import steel, yet we can make the same grade here. We realize that uh, in the country, we have capacity that can be used to scale up production of uh, liquid steel from the current 210,000 tons to 1.1 million tons with the current capacity in the next five years, between now and 2025, if we do some interventions so we don't need any new investments in the tail end, that is the, ups, the downstream, the, ro the rolling of uh, steel products. We don't need any new investments in these five years up to 2025 in this, in this phase of the industry. We also, from the assessment, noted that our per capita steel consumption is at 13.1 kilograms as opposed to five kilograms, which is quoted in the documents, especially those which were by the international organizations. Per capita steel consumption is an index that is used also to gauge the economic development of a country. And we are projected to be at 30 kilograms by 2030. Then uh, we realized from the assessment that we can produce a ton of steel at $100 less when we use the available iron ore and import coal. So when we did the assessment, the taxes, the transport, so we can have our steel produced cheaper when we produce it here. And we also, lastly, we found out that there are private investors that have come in, they, like the mining company, uh, uh, Sino Minerals, which has invested in mining, we have uh, Tembo Steels is already establishing a sponge iron plant in Iganga, and they plan to commission in December. There is a, a logistics company called Springwood Capital that is transporting coal and iron ore. So private investors have come into the space, and the stage is set. Briefly, moderate, I ask what do we need to do next? The most critical thing is to bridge the gap between the mining and the steel production. There is a, a gap, we need to produce sponge iron, and as we noted, uh, private investors have come into this space. One company is on the ground, another one is planning to do so. What government needs to do to support it is to remove tax on coal importation, so that because this is a required raw material, and coal is being brought in from Tanzania, to activate the use of water transport, across Lake Victoria, probably need to dedicate a ship to bring in coal, which will reduce on the transportation costs and also guarantee steady supply. We need to work on rehabilitating the meter gauge railway, which can ease transportation of coal and also the final products. Uh, we need to revoke non-performing licenses, as identified. People hold licenses for a number of times or change the regime. And, but we need to find a way of unlocking that sector so that we invite in other uh, players. And uh, lastly, moderator, we need to build the human capacity, especially metallurgists in this industry, in this area. They are critically needed so that they can develop the sector. And probably we might need to have an agency that can oversee the growth of this sector, given its criticality in development. Thank you very much, Doctor. Good summary. Um, at least uh, the most of the 
drivers you speak about, the Honorable Minister is here with us uh, around infrastructure. But also down the road, I think we have another session that will be discussing the infrastructure bottlenecks for some of um, uh, these minerals. We have so far tackled only two uh, value chains. Uh, um, that is the developmental minerals and the iron ore. Um, because of COVID, it also allows us now to fly to Perth. I don't know if um, Michael Rodriguez from Javua Mining is with us. Yes, Michael. Is it good afternoon or good evening? Where you are? It's good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Michael. Hi, how are you? Um, Michael yeah, very well, thank you. comes with the wealth of experience uh, from Javois Mining um, that he has designing, building, and operating refineries and smelters around the world. Um, Michael, could you be able to share with us what you think are the key issues that we need to understand as Uganda, uh, why and when mineral value chains are successfully developed, and, the func and how they function globally around the world, and what lessons should we take as Uganda? based on the submissions you've had from uh, the other three panelists. Uh, thank you, Ashawa, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure for, for me to represent Jawa at the ninth uh, mining conference, Ugandan mining conference. Uh, you may be aware that we operate over four, that is, uh, I'm getting a bit of feedback here. Let me just. Um, yeah, so we're operating over four continents and uh, we've got experience of what some of the positives and negatives are for very few restrictions. Uh, value add does vary from mineral to mineral. Our operation is in the United States of America, where we're operating in Idaho. It has a strong history of mining, and it also is very prospective for, for battery metals. We're a battery metals focused company, such as copper, cobalt, uh, and nickel. And the opportunity for uh, Jervais was to um, progress to be a bankable feasibility study uh, the feasibility of bringing the Idaho cobalt operations into operation, producing a concentrate was our focus. Uh, that's where a lot of the value add is. In fact, an intermediate product is where most of the value added product is, unless you want to control downstream units. Um, and that has a, that has a history. Uh, if you've got OEMs uh, such as battery manufacturers or, or in fact motor vehicle manufacturers, it clearly makes sense to be able to produce a product that can feed directly into that industry. Um, we recently finished the bankable feasibility study. Uh, it's all in the public domain. Um, we plan to develop the mine and the concentrator to produce uh, circa 2,000 tonnes per annum of co co contained cobalt in concentrate and approximately 3,000 tonnes of contained copper in concentrate. Uh, and that has uh, some some uh, byproduct credits of 5,000 ounces a year of, of contained gold. Um, as I said, that's where most of the value add is. We looked at a refinery in country um, that is in a commercial uh, facility that we own in in Idaho. Uh, and it, some of the benefits of operating in Idaho, I think um, uh, some of the strengths uh, are for there to see. They are clearly for a refinery, you need access to competitive power. You need access to uh, a skilled labour workforce. Um, you need, you need a, a regulatory framework which is consistent. Uh, so all of these types of uh, focus for us, which is the sunk capital on uh, infrastructure, whether it's roads, rail, ports, they're all really important when you're looking at um, investing significant funds into a refinery. So the refinery, we completed an engineering study uh, and the, the uh, capital cost of a refinery was in the order of, of 180 million US. The mine and the concentrator 
um, were approximately 80 million US investment. Uh, now you can see the delta is huge. Um, to to go value add downstream, you need you need life, you need long life, and you need high volume. So for us, we when we completed the engineering study, we could see that uh, it simply wasn't commercial to put a refinery in in the United States. So we were bold and innovative, and we looked at what some of the real options uh, were for us if we wanted to get that uh, that incremental value between typical typical payables um, and then the refined LME for nickel and LMB for cobalt. Um, so when you look at the that value add, we started to look at existing facilities and. In Brazil, there was a refinery that was available uh, and the rest is history. We purchased that for a nominal amount and we plan to bring that into uh, production. Now, you can see that uh, the relative cost of an existing facility compared to a new facility, uh, really, that's where for us the real excitement was. This refinery in um, a the refinery in Sao Paulo, which is uh, the San Miguel Palista refinery, historically produced up to 25,000 tonnes of contained nickel in LME cathode, cut cathode, and approximately 2,000 tonnes of uh, ca ca broken cathode as cobalt LMB product. So that facility has a demonstrated history of operation and has demonstrated product quality. So when you do the comparison, the capital intensity and the flexibility that we have in not only leveraging, uh, being able to refine the product or concentrate that we plan to produce from Idaho, but also we have another facility, um, a large undeveloped nickel laterite on the east coast of West of Australia. Um, and we recently completed uh, another engineering study on that facility. Uh, to produce up to 15,000 tonnes of contained nickel in our intermediate product, an MHP, um, and uh, approximately 1,500 tonnes per annum of cobalt in an MHP. We also looked at a refinery for that facility. Uh, and again, the refinery capital cost was significant. It was approximately $200 odd million, um, that sort of order of magnitude. Now, you can see that this facility that we've purchased, this refinery, has the ability to go downstream, not only to process the product that we're producing at um, uh, Idaho uh, as concentrate, but also other third party feeds and potentially uh, feed product from uh, our project in, uh, in, in Australia. So there were some real positives in all of that. Uh, and as I said, um, the jurisdiction in Brazil is, uh, it, it's in fact, very similar from a competitive labour, competitive energy costs. It's, uh, it's essentially all hydro, similar to Idaho. Uh, so you, you, those are the, some of the, the two biggest input costs to refining is in fact uh, labour and energy. Uh, and those are the two areas where if you're seeking to, uh, to sink capital into a project like a refinery, uh, that that you do look globally to maximise your return. Um, and that offered uh, a very good uh, return on investment. So uh, we're quite encouraged by that and we look forward to progressing our plans to move from mine through to concentrate and then ultimately through to refined products. And potentially um, there is some uh, work that we're, we will look at, not immediately, but uh, in a staged, measured way to look at chemicals. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, just hold the line, we'll be coming back to you. But briefly, just for closing remarks, I'd like to come to my panel here, and I'll start with Frank, and ask that based on what has been discussed, what is your view on the value chains of the different minerals? Because we've had three examples, the developmental minerals, we've had the iron ore, and then we've had Michael speaking about the cobalt and the value addition and what is required. Does it mean to you that all the minerals need to have the same approach 
or it's quite different and it's a different uh, environment. In two minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in, uh, in fact, there is a need to do value chain mapping uh, for all different mineral resources. We have energy minerals, uh, which have different products. A product determines the value chain, the end product. It's even in agriculture, agro-based industries, you have fruits and veg and others, different value chains. So different value chains stem out of mineral resources. We have energy minerals, coal, oil and gas, and others. They produce plastics and so forth. Then you have metallic minerals, uh, steel, zinc, copper, dam and gold and so forth, uh, which feed into uh, the metallic, metallurgical industries. You have other industries, main minerals that feed into electronic in the, uh, uh, industries, uh, cobalt, copper, and so forth. So, and then you have non-metallic industries, the hops, uh, development minerals, that feed into construction and industrial minerals. So different minerals produce different value chains depending on the product and the market you're targeting. So as we move into how do we assist member states, including Uganda? Uh, I think someone alluded to this, and it is a fact that minerals are finite. And we are looking at sustainable development of mineral resources for structural transformation of our economies and sustainable development. Sustainable development, it means that you are looking at developing, developing those resources for today's generation, but taking into account the future generation. And if you are going to do that, we need to look at strategic minerals that you can competitively add value to and be able to market them either to the market at the regional level or continental level. Let me end by just talking about three Cs in these value chains. Uh, we have the comparative advantage, which everybody thinks about. Africa has comparative advantage. We have resources. We don't know how much we have, but we know we have. Now, we need to turn that into the competitive advantage. What can you competitively add value to to be competitive? If you're going to add value to steel, and most of the economies, including Nigeria and others, who have tried to add value to steel, and I'm happy that the last speaker alluded to the fact that you can actually add value and be cheaper in Uganda. And he has alluded to the per capita steel consumption, and I believe that is for Uganda. But if you put it on, a, on, on, on East Africa for 200 million people, what is the per capita consumption? It makes me demand go high. And the third C would be connecting to markets. So depending on the market you want to market to, to target, under the continent of Little area, Africa has a huge market. Under Comesa and East African community, Africa has a huge market. If we are targeting African market, what are the resources we are going to add value to, to, to actually feed our demand? Maybe we shall have the next rich man coming from steel, as we have Dangote from cement, thank which you. is a mineral resource. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Abraham Mwanguzi. Just as a parting shot, you highlighted about the different inputs and the challenges. I just want to put to you, uh, what is your view of how the different ministries are speaking to each other to make sure that they unlock this potential? Because you spoke of energy, roads, and all these other things. Kindly, in uh, two minutes to summarize, uh, what do you think should be done? Uh, thank you. I think uh, the government is already moving in the right direction with the third national development plan which is uh, program based it is aimed at bringing all the different government ministries departments and agencies to deliver on a given uh, output so the working together is already uh, in the offing within this year and uh, we are moving in that direction to see that we deliver on this for the iron and steel industry, as I lighted, the components to develop it are already there along the entire value chain. We have investment in mining. We already have investment which is coming up in iron making, which is refining the ore. And we have overcapacity in the rolling, in the rolling uh, section. So the components are there, they're in place. And as the, what we need to do is to stabilize the power, work on the transport, uh, facilitate the private sector through the removal of uh, taxes on those inputs which are required, like the coal, to come in and then build the human capacity. And lastly, as it said, uh, 
if it is not made of steel, probably steel was used to make it. Thank and you very 90 much. percent of the metal in the world is, is steel. So it is the right time to develop the iron and steel value chain with the coming on of the oil and gas sector, with the motor vehicle assembly plant being completed next year in Ginger and the industrialization drive. The time is now. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Um, do we still have Michael online for a parting shot? Michael, are you still with us? Uh, as we wind down, I think Michael is off. Um, I'd just like to say, before I hand over to the next session, is that, ah, yes, Michael, uh, in just two minutes, can you summarize for us uh, any parting shots to what you think Uganda needs to do to be able to give comfort to say Javois, to be able to bring capital and be able to build a functional mine in Uganda? We're very pleased to be operating in Uganda today. We, we in fact, continue the exploration on our tenements that are prospective, highly prospective for copper cobalt and potentially uh, PGs. Um, and we're continuing to focus on that. There, there is a strong history of, uh, of mineral exploration in Uganda. Um, more recently, clearly that's, that hasn't been the case, but historically um, we know and we understand that it's highly prospective for battery metals. And we're quite excited about our footprint there now, if I was to look for across the continents that we operate in and look at um, where we see some of the, the strengths where we continue to invest downstream is um, really removing obstacles for private enterprises. And that means that uh, the infrastructure, which a number of the speakers have spoken to, needs to be there. Uh, the, the, the ongoing investment in uh, both um, trades and tertiary education is really important being able to supply skilled local labour in order to add value because the, the, the more complex or as you go downstream uh, in some metals, in particular cobalt and uh, nickel, it does have a, a, a different set of expertise. Now, even the welding in some of these uh, facilities needed, need to be the next level of coded welders. So you can see if you've invested in education and support the skill upset, uh, the skilling of um, the local labour, then that takes one of the impediments away. Then there's clearly the infrastructure. Competitive power, which Uganda does have, is really important. And then it's, it's all about transport. It's about transporting your key reagents into a facility and then being able to export your product. Uh, those really do feed into the, uh, the, the thinking or the ability for uh, private sector to invest. And clearly one of the, uh, one of the areas that government uh, can, can support is directly investing in some of that infrastructure, but also really, really important um, is a strong, stable regulatory framework, because that really does, it's all about the risk reward. Mining, exploration mining is uh, a high risk, high reward. Uh, and clearly, as you can see by the examples that you've heard, um, the, the more downstream you go, or the, as you go downstream, that capital intensity goes up. Uh, so you, you really need to manage the, uh, the sovereign risk profile. Um, and so I think there's some real positives in what I've seen, what we've seen as an organisation. We continue to be uh, excited about the opportunity of Kilembi being opened up. And, uh, and I think those obstacles um, it can really be supported and driven by by state um, and local governments, and we're happy. We're more more than happy to be part of the part, part of a private enterprise seeking to develop um, for the benefit of all Ugandans and uh, a, a another facility. Well, uh, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, Honourable Minister, the takeaways, as you've heard from the distinguished panel, uh, a fantastic regulatory framework, uh, human capital development, uh, infrastructure bottlenecks, road and rail, and stable and available energy resources, but also that mineral value addition is different from different types of minerals. And I think that conversation needs to happen. Thank you so much. As we come to a close to this session, 
I'd like to welcome you to the next session that will be moderated by uh, my senior, our General Secretary, Mr. Sam Thaka, and they'll be speaking about how to move from potential, as the first and second panels have spoken, to actually developing minds that will have, uh, will be able to take forward our conversation and social economic transformation. Thank you so much. Uh, right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure if uh, you can hear me. We're okay, good. Now, um, just so that you are aware, this, this session we've already, from, from morning, we have already had the uh, aspects of what we need to do to improve the economy, that how do minerals improve the economy for Uganda. You've just finished a session now with regards to the key developments uh, for a successful minerals value chain. And now, just before lunch, the most important uh, topic for us to discuss going forward is how do we convert Uganda from a mineral potential country to a mining country? And these are the steps that you will hear about throughout today as well, uh, including the aspects of financing and everything else later on. So make sure you're tuned in in the afternoon. Um, our session today needs to focus on this, this continuous issue of Uganda has shown that it has potential for minerals. This was done uh, prior to our independence. And we have now got to really start looking at taking what was done previously and Uganda having mines previously, we are now back into exploration phases on new minerals and new areas. And we have to now look at, can we actually make Uganda a mining nation and ensure that the mining and the minerals that we extract add value, not only to the country and to our nation, but to our general region as a whole. So, without further ado, I know that everyone will be watching their, their time very closely because lunch will be served soon, but I would like us to go straight into, into me introducing one of uh, our pan uh, 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 three of our panelists that are here in the studio. Um, I want to start primarily with the question that I just, uh, on, the, on the issue of, of mining in Uganda. Um, we have with us uh, Mr. Gershom Mugizi. Uh, Gershom, you're very welcome. Um, Gershom uh, is a geologist for a company called, and working with a company called GeoQuest. He will give you more information on that. As you would have noticed, we have avoided advertising uh, in this session, so they will do their own advertising and marketing for free on us. So, Gershom, we've been talking now, uh, as far as I, and I've been uh, in this, this sector for coming up to nearly 15 odd years, we've been talking about the mineral potential for Uganda uh, for 15 odd years. Uh, we know that there are some areas that are covered already, but in your opinion, you being a geologist, you being the person on the ground, you have seen a lot of Uganda and you have seen a lot of the samples of Uganda, let alone Uganda. I'm sure you've been to lodges and everything else, but you've been more interested in rocks, I hope. Um, where, where, where do you think we are now? Where's the, where, where is the potential for investment in Uganda with regards to uh, uh, mining and exploration works? Uh, thank you, uh, Sam. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, watching us. Um, you want to know the potential and uh, where the mining uh, investment could be done. Uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, I will want to uh, begin by saying uh, the government, through the Ministry of Energy and Mineral uh, Development, has, uh, um, with its partners, um, done quite commendable work. Uh, in terms of uh, establishing uh, these resources uh, by doing uh, various studies, geological studies, and uh, the information that is available from the histor historical times, uh, even uh, before independence, uh, shows that uh, there is, th there is um, different minerals. Uh, we have the rare earths, starting off from Kotido to uh, down to Kisoro, there is uh, rare earth elements. You have uh, the vermiculite. You have the the, the uh, 
clays. There's a lot of potential in clays. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, kaolin. That's an area that has not been really, uh, um, go, that has not got a lot of investment, but there is a lot of potential because from the information that is available, you, you have um, glass sand in areas of Masaka. Th there is Kilembe, as everyone has been talking about, Kilembe, copper cobalt. And so these are areas that people uh, need to be aware of. Uh, and we will continue the discussion and we see uh, what is uh, required. So when we talk about the industrial minerals, for example, and development minerals, uh, we, we are looking at uh, 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 clays uh, that we are, people can add value into paints, mm. uh, pharmaceuticals, and all the, the rest of the things that uh, can be done uh, from that. And then there is gemstones. And uh, gemstones you have uh, in Karamoja, especially in Karamoja, uh, the, the, that's an area where um, uh, yeah, those, are, those are good areas, Gershom. With regards to you know the areas of gemstones and everything else, we know those are small. We don't talk about them quite a bit, but we know that those areas are there. We know Karamoja also needs a little bit more work done on the aerial surveys, etc. Yes. So, in, in your opinion, where, where, would, where would an investor start looking, besides going to the, 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 the Directorate for Geological Surveys and Mines, where, where, where would they want to put their money down? Where, what minerals do you think are, uh, are top on our list over here? All right. Uh, and now, currently, of course, there is a lot of demand in terms of uh, the battery minerals, the green, uh, en uh, the green energy resources. Yes. So, yes. We, uh, these are areas, if you look at uh, places like Mitiana, a lot of, of uh, work was done previously. And uh, in Mitiana, in uh, Mubende, some work was done, and then uh, th there is still... Uh, what we need, basically, to do now is to look at uh, the, the, the first stages of exploration uh, that can be uh, done, and then we, we move on from there, first evaluate right. those minerals. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Perfect. Thank you, Gershom. I think that's, very, that, that's quite uh, informative. Because now we know that there are several minerals, several areas that we can look at in Uganda. We are not stuck with just the aspects of gold and the, the precious metal, so to speak. So it's good to know what we have on ground and what we're looking at and where the opportunities lie for exploration. Now, I want to move on very quickly because I'm always very conscious of, of our time uh, limits. But I want to introduce to, to uh, the audience today Dr. Jennifer Hinton. Uh, Dr. Jen, I'm not used to calling her doctor, so you'll forgive me if I call her Jennifer, but uh, uh, Dr. Hinton, you are working as the country head for Chevois. Uh, we've just heard from Chevois in the previous session, so I'm not going to ask you to repeat everything you said. I want to hear some fresh news from you. Uh, with regards to what we're doing in Uganda right now, with regards to the minerals value addition that we talk about, you've been, I think, with me on several occasions where we've been talking about this extensively. Um, where, are you, where, where do you see, and now there's got to be some distinction made, I think, at this point, between companies coming in for exploration purposes, companies coming in for mining purposes. Do we, in Uganda, do you feel that we understand this distinction well enough at the moment? What can you, what can you add on to that to, to help us understand? Once the red light's on, it's on. Nope. I'm too short. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, just to follow up on terms of new news, uh, Michael spoke earlier about how we've become or are becoming uh, a vertically integrated cobalt supply chain company. So uh, we're, we're developing the only cobalt mine in the US. Mm -hmm. We just acquired a refinery in Brazil. And ideally, that, that uh, refinery product may come back, say, to the auto industry, to battery makers. Yeah. So we are one of these green energy mineral companies yes. uh, with the growth of, of electric vehicles around the world. I know Uganda has electric buses, for example, and those buses need batteries. Mm. Um, and those batteries need green minerals, such as lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper. Mm. So we're focused wholly on, in Uganda on the exploration of, of cobalt, copper, uh, nickel and associated minerals that come with it, and uh, we've, we've been uh, focusing intensively on that for a few years. 
Um, in terms of the linkage, say exploration, mining, and then a step further, minerals value addition, uh, I think the disconnect, I mean, often we're on the ground and people think that we're mining, uh, but exploration, looking for big deposits. We're looking for large mineral deposits can be developed into large, modern, technologically advanced industrial mines. And that process uh, can take, on average, it takes six to 10 years of exploration. We're, of course, expediting that process, the, the rate of productivity that we have as a company. But what people don't understand is there are multiple steps. So you start with early phase exploration, which we've done on our areas, and then you identify targets and say, okay, what's below the surface? You start drilling. Sometimes you're lucky and it's interesting and you say, okay, this looks positive, let's keep drilling. Um, other times the target is not positive. All that money you spent is essentially gone. You have data and information, but you start looking at other targets in other places. For positive targets, you take another step. And then if you do find something, you'll want to understand how deep is it, how big it is, how wide it is, how long it is, what are the properties. And you might find, even after spending several millions of dollars, that it's too deep, or it's too small, or there's a weird amount of arsenic, or there's something that that is not necessarily positive, and that will stop the process. So, uh, sorry, Jennifer, mm -hmm. let me just cut in there qu uh, mm -hmm. quickly. Just, uh, I, I'm assuming mm -hmm. the viewers are going to range from um, the ones mm -hmm. that understand mining and minerals and exploration already mm -hmm. to the ones that are watching it and are trying to understand it for the first time. I'll start simple. Are you telling me that, that uh, a company like yours, like yeah. Jevois, would come into Uganda and under the exploration mm -hmm. element where you are digging these holes uh, mm -hmm. on various pieces of land and vast pieces of land, mm -hmm. you're saying that you have the risk that you may end up spending millions of dollars and then get nothing from yep. it? Yep, there's projects and, and exploration is simply all the research and studies to first of all find and then measure and prove that something can be viably developed into a mine. Okay. And so you can spend $10 million, $20 million, $30 million, there's projects which have invested $120 million in exploration, gone to bankable feasibility study, and been determined to be not feasible, which means that money is gone. So this would, this would it's explain... very high risk. So this would explain the need for larger companies like Javois and foreign investors mm -hmm. coming in to do this kind of work to, to assist risk. us to, to, to see the, the benefits that can be derived. To take the risk, yeah. And when you do prove something is there, then you look at mine development operations, and importantly, as we heard, I think, in every session this morning, um, a refinery, a smelter, downstream beneficiation, yeah. that roadmap is different for every single mineral. We need to know the steps to getting to that. Mm. But those facilities generally are large, and you don't, you don't have one mine, one smelter anymore. Mm. You usually yeah. have five mines, 10 mines, 20 mines. And as one mine is being depleted, or five mines are being depleted, mm. you need more exploration to discover more mines. Um, to feed that smelter, feed that refinery. So right. some countries, for example, have 110 com companies like ours spending the same amounts of money just looking for copper, for example. Um, Perfect. Okay, so, so in, that's in, what we need. Yeah, so, <laughs> so in the sense, and, and I'm, I'm just going to dwell on you a little bit more, one mm -hmm. more question, then I want to definitely move on to Felix because this will lead on to his part. Mm -hmm. So if we have this kind of money coming into the country just to explore with the, possibil with the possibility that yep. uh, Jevois can walk away and say, right, we've spent $25 million now and uh, we've got nothing, so we're going back home. Now, what, what, if we find something, Jevois is doing wonderful work in Uganda and are mm -hmm. one of the most compliant companies that I have seen in my time in, mm -hmm. in this sector uh, in okay. Uganda with regards to how you're approaching every step of the requirements and the policies and the processes and the regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things within all of this is, how do you then foresee that on exploration, are there separate rules on exploration and separate rules on mining? How, how, would, how does that work? Because exploration is literally you putting money mm -hmm. in. There's no yeah. revenue to be made, right? Yeah, so and internationally, uh, most companies doing exploration are only exploration companies. All they do is explore, and then if and when they find something, that's when they get their revenue. They'll bring in a major partner and get revenue that way. 
Um, and, and it's not just getting revenue from that one project. They also have to pay for their 99 projects that failed. Mm. So this is something that, that often isn't, isn't considered and needs to be considered within the regulatory and legal framework. Um, our company is one example of a company that is actually our, our leadership, our board, they're miners. They're coming from international large-scale mining companies. Um, they're doing exploration because the world needs cobalt and we need to find more of it. Um, but the intent is to find something, develop it, and then, and then look at the viability of, of what's possible downstream. Uh, but that isn't always the norm. Um, One yeah. more quick question for you sure. before Felix. Sure. Do you think we're doing sufficient amount of exploration right now, or is there room for more? Not at all. Um, I, I get um, a lot of queries from international mm -hmm. companies. Um, and international companies like ours, they're not just saying, oh, Uganda is wonderful, but they're comparing Uganda to Malawi, to Ecuador, to Peru, to Nigeria, to Mongolia. Yeah. So it's, it's not just, um, you know, having a company like ours here does help uh, because it shows that, that you can make progress, and, and I'm a, a big cheerleader all the time. Um, but it is important to say the first questions are not about mineral potential. Uh, because DGSM, Department of Mines, or Directorate of Mines, already has fantastic data, much of it online, and you can acquire data, and that helps. But by the time they get to me, the question they ask is mineral export ban, and number one, and number two, uh, legal regulatory framework. So, so in terms of attracting companies, uh, we need to be thinking of those things, and what is a deterrent, and mm -hmm. what's going to attract um, Uganda is becoming competitive, very yes. competitive with power, infrastructure, roads. We'll talk about that this afternoon, but, mm. but these things are fundamental. No, yeah. very good. And, I, and mm -hmm. I believe that we're also in the process of, of uh, looking at the, uh, uh, an improved and a, a newer version, I suppose, with a V8 engine on the Mining Act, uh, <laughs> which hopefully will take into consideration these points of where we mm -hmm. need the support of larger investors coming in on the exploration side as well. So Definitely. it's going to be quite interesting to see where that goes. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that aspect about regulatory uh, that we're, we're looking at, and we know in my time it's been, it's been a, a constant issue to ensure that exploration licenses that have limited time, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. as well, uh, where you are supposed to complete your exploration work yeah. within a certain amount of time, seven years or so, yeah. uh, and if not, then it can be revoked from you, etc. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details mm -hmm. of that. Uh, but I wanted to move on into, into standards and regulations and what we're mm -hmm. looking at. We've got international standards. We've got mm -hmm. international regulatory requirements for all companies uh, in mining uh, globally. We've mm -hmm. also got um, various aspects coming into play in Uganda now with the, with the uh, mining regulations having been updated. Now, that is where I want us to introduce Mr. Felix Bob Okiti, mm -hmm. who is now, uh, I'm going to say he is slightly like a fish out of water here, because he is under the Petroleum Authority uh, on a mining issue, but Felix, your knowledge on this matter is extremely important, and you know that the regulatory requirements in oil and gas are extremely stringent. Now, what are we doing with the, with the rest of the mining sector, with the mineral sector? And what's happening with um, things like AMREC and the rest? Felix. Thank you very much, Sam, for, uh, <clears throat> for that question. First of all, yes, um, uh, I work for the Petroleum Authority of Uganda as a senior geologist. But I'm here at, uh, at the capacity of a member of the AMREC uh, Technical Working Group, which is a working group under the auspices of the African Union Commission. Um, about three years ago, the African Union Commission put together a working group, a technical working group of, of expertise mm. in the mining and ener energy sector from across the member states in Africa. And they were basically um, um, put together with one purpose, to design a comprehensive uh, um, minerals and energy resource management system. And uh, that team comprises, of course, of, 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 of all member states and, 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 and basically uh, was uh, put in place to ensure that we achieve the aspirations of the African mining vision. You may want to understand that uh, in the context of the African Union, my minerals includes everything, include oil and gas as well. And so that's the reason why uh, I'm here and, and as, as part of the, the AMREC uh, team. Um, 
What is AMREC, you asked? Mm. Um, AMREC is basically an acronym, uh, an acronym for the African Minerals and Energy Resource Classification and Management System. And this is a system that has been developed comprehensively to try and bring a little bit of order. You've noticed from, the, from morning, we have been hearing a lot of things about um, uh, maybe the mining sector does not necessarily uh, is applicable in terms of the production sharing agreements. You've heard about uh, talks about how much we, we may not know exactly how much we know uh, we want to, uh, we have in terms of gold, cobalt, all these things. And, and that's exactly the aspiration that we, we foresaw in Africa mining vision. And that's why this group was constituted. So we have worked very hard to try and develop this for the African continent. And uh, AMREC basically has two components to it. The first component is the component of resource estimation and classification. And what, what do we mean by this? We want to be able to be sure that if we talk about one ton of gold in Uganda, that is the same ton of gold in Ghana, in South Africa, in Mozambique, in Zambia. So that's exactly what we are trying to look at. And so the classification system draws its um, uh, specifications and standards from the global United Nations framework classification for resources. Why is that very important? Because uh, the UNFC looks at uh, having a, a single classification system across all minerals and energy resources so that it, it is repeatable across the continent. And, and that ensures that we can be able to have the same um, uh, understanding when we talk about reserves because reserve is a technical term. Mm. And most people don't want to use it, especially in the minerals solid mineral sectors. Because if you talk about the reserves of gold, then everybody here pops up and says, okay, what are you talking about here? Because that's a technical term that means something much more deeper, a very high degree of understanding and certainty about the mineral resource you're talking about. In, in the oil and gas, that's what actually constitutes your asset base in yeah. terms of a company. So if, if we have Javel, for example, talking about a certain amount of cobalt in Uganda, we would want to have these uh, system, the AMREC system, to be the understanding of that amount of cobalt or, or, or uranium or platinum or whatever mineral we're talking about is the same understanding in Zambia, is the same understanding in Ghana, is the same understanding in Uganda. That, so that's the first aspect of the, uh, the AMREC uh, uh, system. The second aspect of the AMREC system is the Pan-African uh, reserves, resources and reserves reporting code. Now, you may want to understand that across the continent, except with South Africa, there's no reporting code anywhere in Africa. And so you find that if an investor comes in Africa, for example, they're going to tell them, okay, you're going to report this based on Toronto Stock Exchange uh, requirements, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Australian Stock Exchange, and any other stock exchange across the globe. Mm. I think that it's high time when we're talking about value addition into the mining sector, we have to think about Africa actually adopting a reporting system that is recognized across the continent. And why is this very important? We have all have talked about the volumetrics and the figures that people talk. Um, maybe World Bank will give you their figures. IMF will give them. Any other person, any other group across the globe will give you figures. What are Africans actually saying? Everyone is telling us about how much we have. But what are the Africans saying about how much we actually have? And that is the critical question. Because if you ask anybody today about how much gold we have in Africa, you'll probably get 10 people with 10 different answers. And that's because we do not have a repetitive, a repetitive system that we can be able to rely on and say, if, we are going to, if you're a company and you're going to list on a, on a Ugandan stock exchange or South African stock exchange or whatever stock exchange, and then I ask you, how have you really evaluated this resource to come up with this figure? Now, that's what the aspiration of the system is, is all about. Because we will agree that two-thirds of African uh, export is actually in the extractive mm -hmm. industries. And, 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 and we can also appreciate the fact that over 50% of our revenue is on, on commodity-based value. So we cannot rely on every other person's standard without adopting an African system that meets our African aspiration. And this is embedded in the Agenda 2063 of the African Union. Excellent, Felix. Now, there, there's several points from that which I've picked up on. First and foremost, if we're looking at, at uh, the aspects of AMREC, is this going to now be 
something that is going to be developed into law in, in, into the continent? Is this something that is going to be mandatory and, a, and, a, and there's going to be a regulatory body which will ensure that AMREC is mentioned in every single policy and act in each country? How, how, how are we going to manage? Because we've also got the EITI, which we, you know that Uganda has just signed up for as well. Uh, how are these, these great rules and, and great aspects of, of policy and creating standards in this sector, how are we going to implement them? How are they going to be pushed into, into our current policy? That's a very good question, Sam. Um, and, and, and just like any international protocol, the AMREC system is, is an aspiration. And what happens is that we develop this for the... Uh, you first of all need to understand how this be, becomes adopted for implementation in different member states. Of course, at the end of the day, the technical team develops the system and takes it out to the STC, which is a specialized technical uh, mm -hmm. committee of the African Union. And then it goes through the system to the executive council. And then the heads of state in a summit adopts this and be able to, uh, and then uh, they approve this. Now what happens is that, like any international protocol, a jurisdiction like Uganda or any other African country will then adopt this and it becomes a policy. When it becomes a policy, then it becomes a regulatory issue. I'll give you an example. For example, I come from the background of oil and gas. In our laws, we say that we are using the petroleum resource management system and any other classification or resource management system anywhere around the world. So what, what does that mean? What that means is that a country will therefore pick up a good document like this one, which will help to ensure that every aspect of mineral resource management is actually taken care of and then put it into a policy. And then it becomes a regulation. When it becomes a regulation, a country can decide to enforce it. And right now we are enforcing in the oil. We, I know we have Crisco, for example, as, as a mineral um, uh, resource um, uh, management system. And, 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 and we, we have bridged, we have, have, we have an abridged, uh, a bridging document for the UNFC to Crisco. And what that, what that does is that it ensures that we do not do away with Crisco that has been used for many years in the mineral, in solid minerals um, uh, industry, but we, we, we enhance it with peculiar interests and peculiar understandings on the African continent. I'll give you an example, environmental management. Right now, if you go to South Africa, you find over 200,000 hectares of land that has been uh, you know, degraded as a result of uh, gold mining. In Zambia, over 250,000 hectares of land degraded as a result of um, copper mining yeah. and so forth. And this kind of experience is replicated all over Africa. Now, if we, that component of environmental management is something you cannot find in other uh, uh, resource classification or management systems. And that is exactly why AMREC comes with the superiority and says, look, if you're an investor, in order for you to have value uh, of, of, uh, and, and for you to be received well in Africa, you need to have a component of environmental management. What do we do? And we propose some of the very key aspects. Mm. For example, um, you know, um, reclaiming some of this wasteful land. We have seen this happen in Ghana with the, you know, planting of uh, Japsofa, uh, oil palm trees to regenerate uh, you know, yes. uh, copper mines and things like that, gold mm. mines and things like that. So yeah. this is the aspiration of AMREC as, 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 as a, man, a resource management system, which will be able to be cutting across the continent. Mm. And so the question of whether it, it is law or voluntary is a question that a jurisdiction has to make based on the value that they can derive mm. from the AMREC system. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this back to you and to Jennifer. Sorry, Gershom, I'm not involving you so much, but I want, I've, I've got something specific for you. Now, when we're talking about these laws, and, and when we, you mentioned that uh, this is coming from your, your uh, experience in, in oil and gas. Now, in oil and gas in Uganda, uh, during the exploration phases, these laws and regulations were not in place. These laws and regulations were put after exploration when we knew that we had a quantifiable set of reserves and we were looking at the production. We're talking about mining right now and, and Uganda being in the exploration stage of, uh, of uh, mining. Now, if we're putting all of these things now, are they still going to be viable? I mean, uh, Jennifer, as a on, as private sector on your side, um, as an exploration company, if Javois was introduced to AMREC and to EITI and said you're going to have to comply to these standards in Uganda right now because this is how we're going to mm -hmm. allow you to come with your $100 million plus. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know your numbers. I'm assuming it's that big. 
but uh, so please don't quote me. Um, would you have considered it then, or would you have said no? We're, you know, we need to come in and do what we need to do, and we 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 can't appeal to all of these um, policies. I think actually you make an important point. Uh, we have capacity, and this is important that when laws are put in place. We also don't exclude maybe domestic companies that have, have fewer resources, uh, smaller companies that, that might need a lot of training, yeah. which is where organizations uh, such as African Union maybe come into play in terms of building capacity and the government would come to play. Uh, but for us, um, this is one of the benefits, I guess, of being on, on a public company. We're on the ASX in Australia, the TSX in Canada, which both have their own separate certification systems that are very similar to what he's talking about for AMREC. We do have to comply with both. And I think it's very important uh, to think at practical level about why this system is important. Um, you can imagine, I think it was eight years ago at the Mineral Wealth Conference, uh, I was sitting with another TSX listed company who have to comply with that standard in Canada. It's an international standard. And someone gave a presentation, and they said, we have reserves of this many tons of gold. If this is a kilometer and a half long, if it's three meters wide, if it's 20 meters deep, we have X tons of gold. And now even in publications, when people talk about that place, it's published in, as a reserve. Mm. And you, we can't even use the word reserve unless we go through a number of standards that are very transparent. And you can imagine there's been discussions previously about why, why aren't uh, Ugandans or Africans investing in the sector. They can imagine if you want to invest in the sector, but are you going to invest in a company that produces a reserve that you can do on a cocktail napkin? Or are you going to invest in a company that has to be very clear and honest about the results they're getting, how they're getting the results, how they're getting to those numbers? Because we're talking about big amounts of investment. So, yeah. so this is why this is extremely important. And I hope there will be a lot of capacity building. With respect to the environmental social elements, mm. um, those ones aren't necessarily in the international classification systems, JORC and 43101 that we use. But on the stock exchanges and basically driven by the markets now, we have a growing responsibility in what's called environmental, social, and governance factors. Mm. So increasingly, we're expected to report on our environmental performance, our social performance, um, labor performance, what percentage of our, our workforce is local, are we uh, complying with human rights, are we respecting the environment, protecting, and now increasingly expectations uh, to take action with respect to climate change, mm. uh, which is very exciting. So these things are actually fit perfectly with the direction and the expectations for exploration companies, mm. and especially mining companies that are growing. Um, I think okay. it's very positive, but, but we do need to think about companies that might not have the same capacity as us. Mm. So we don't want to leave them behind as well. Yeah, no, I mean, one yeah. of the things is that, I mean, when you're looking at exploration and uh, you, when you're looking at your budgetary requirements on exploration as well, you're looking at millions of dollars, like you said. Mm -hmm. Now, that, I think, would automatically exclude quite a lot of Ugandan companies and Ugandan investors going into a high-risk operation of being able to throw millions of dollars at this mm -hmm. and the hope of something coming out of it. Mm -hmm. But on the same note, we also have a lot of exploration and mining companies, as is in the current situation, without these laws. Now, uh, Gershom, this is where I want, want your input, because I think you, you are the key person on the ground, and you've had uh, experience not only here, but outside of Uganda. Now, do you think that Ugandan investors, do you think that Ugandan companies will find this an attractive venture to get into based on these new rules coming in and what does it do? Does, how, how are Ugandan companies going to be able to, to manage this? Will they want to manage this in your, in your uh, uh, vast experience? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think it's important uh, for the investor to, to realize the importance of those uh, codes because uh, a lot of companies, as we, we know, um, have used the JORC, as she mentioned, the, the National Instrument 43101 of Canada. And uh, the, the, the importance of these codes is that you, uh, investors get a lot of confidence in the kind of data be, that they get because they, they are 
they sort of regulate of, on how uh, information should be re reported. Uh, I'll give you an example. You, you've probably heard of the BRICS scandal, uh, where, people, where uh, the geologists went to the field and, and uh, smeared gold on the rocks and uh, reported a huge amount of results, of, 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 uh, of uh, resource. So that's how this code started. And uh, uh, every time an investor sees uh, disclosed a result, he wants to know, is this really reliable? Uh, and that's one area where we, they will help because, uh, first of all, they will risk the, the projects. And secondly, uh, you, you have uh, a, a document, if it's a, a, a report, uh, that can be understood by everyone, everyone who is interested in the sector because uh, you might, as uh, he was mentioning, people, some people mention reserves and just it's made out of the blue without even drilling a single hole. And you find someone saying that he has a, a, a reserve uh, based on just a, a, some pits and trenches, and that's all. And they estimate uh, width and length and, and, and then uh, the depth. Uh, but when these codes are in place, if such information, jumbled up information, exaggerated information, uh, this is what we call salting, as I was telling you earlier, uh, where you put some gold in the samples. And so then it becomes criminal for such a company to, uh, to be able to continue. So they put uh, that confidence into the investors and then, uh, of course, more, more, more uh, foreign investors would come into the, the mm. country to, to, to buy into those yeah. projects. Now, Gresham, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, be a little bit controversial because luckily um, they can't cut me off on NBS right now. Uh, they can't take my mic away so I can say what I want. And luckily this will be the last time they will ever call me to present or moderate. <laughs> so uh, my thing over here is, it's not like Uganda doesn't already have rules and regulations and standards, even before, AMRA, even before EITI. We have got compliance requirements with DGSM. You have to submit your reports quarterly to DGSM. You have to go through a very lengthy process with regards to acquiring your uh, exploration license. You still need a prospecting license even before that. Now, my question here is that, again, going back to the, the, the amount of money that gets put into exploration without any real definite results um, for commercial value of that exploration, are we really, number one, are we really, and this is for all three, so please feel free, whoever wants to add to the controversy, are we really being compliant already uh, with the rules that we have to be able to appreciate another level of regulatory policies coming into play? Secondly, why haven't these old rules worked for us? Because as you may be aware, as we are, and, and my white hair again will allow me to say this, so I don't want you to say it, but we have over 1,500 licenses currently out there which are not presenting any form of information or value to us. We don't know what's going on in there because they're not reporting, yet they've been licensed by the DGSM. So how are we going to be able to now introduce this as being the best go-forward method, and this is what is really going to increase our mineral sector, when, like I said, we're still at that mineral potential stage. We haven't climbed out of this for over 15, 20, 30 years now. Yeah? So what do you think, in your opinion, you again being on the ground, I don't, like I said, you can, you can refuse to answer the question if you want, but do you think these additional standards and laws are really going to help us to move forward into mining sector? Um, yes, now um, I want to mention again uh, about what someone earlier said, the, the, that, that missing link, and, and this is where I want to emphasize, uh, because uh, when you look at uh, what the DGSM is doing, what the government is doing, they are regulating these people, and now even there is a, the new um, the mining uh, uh, cadastre online where they are regulating the, 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 the practitioners. But, yeah. but then, what misses in is the, the, the provision of those values or, or results, the actual results from the ground to the, to the ministry. I've, I've seen this, and sometimes it's because probably of, of some mistrust, and it's, it's going to be a, a, an issue that needs to be uh, uh, addressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so where are you going to get this information if someone is not providing it and not doing the actual work? So 
that is an area that needs to be addressed. And uh, obviously, once you have that, that work ongoing and being able to, 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 to prove that the, it's, it's happening, then we know that there is work, the, the, the results are going to be there. Uh, I, I hope I answer your question. Perfect. No, I just want a little bit of intake from, because Felix is dying to yes. get on. He's waiting for you to stop. So, Felix. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sam. Now, uh, I think the undertone I hear from your question is the, is, is, is the aspect of uh, investor confidence in the sectors that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that uh, investor confi um, 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 confidence is basically a function of transparency. And when I talk about transparency, I'm, I, I, I'm talking about uh, paying for what you declare and declaring for what you pay. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I, what I mean by that is that um, as, 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 as an investor, you first of all want to be able to know that before I put my money here, do I have, and, and this is what Jennifer was trying to talk, uh, to talk about, in exploration you really basically don't know what you have. And you're trying to come and risk your money in order to be able to get returns on that investment. But what confidence do you actually have that I'm going to get returns on this investment? And that is where the aspect of transparency comes in. Because if you do not address the aspect of transparency, then you find things like um, you know, um, corruption tendencies on, mm. from the government side, but also illicit financial flows on the company side. And depending on whom you talk to, you can hear figures between 80 and 100 billion US dollars mm. going into illicit transactions. And, and unless we address that aspect of of, of, of transparency, then the issue of investor confidence will not be able to be addressed. And we are trying to do that through AMREC to try and ensure that we have that reporting. And one of the things that uh, Jennifer touched on, and, and, and I wanted to just elaborate a little bit on the uh, Pan-African reporting code, mm. is to try and ensure that we have a seamless and very clear, robust system that looks at what standards, what reporting requirements do you need to have? Aspects of competent persons. So if, if you, and, and the reason why we cannot be able to put a figure very confidently today is because sometimes it comes back to the competences of the persons trying to report these, uh, you, these numbers and these resources and estimating them. So I think your question is a good question and it's a good uh, uh, mind, uh, 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 mind question that you've put across, but I think it goes back to issues of transparency, and it's on both sides, both the government as the state and also the players as the companies. And mm -hmm. that is where I say you must pay for what you declare and declare for what you pay. If you declare what you pay, transparency, you reduce issues of corruption, and when you pay for what you declare, then you, re you increase investors corporate because you manage your risk. Very good. And it'll also make sure that you're getting the right commodity prices because it'll be a global standard. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So now I, I know that uh, we're going to be running out of time. Like I said, everyone's stomachs must be rumbling because either the food is already, the waft is coming into their kitchen from their kitchens. But this is going to be quite interesting. Now, what I want us to do is we've talked a lot about the rules, the standards, regulations, AMREC, everything that's coming in. We've talked about the difference between exploration and mining. And what I want us to now look at, and I want to give each one of you at least a couple of minutes each to, to, to uh, try and put this in your terms, private sector, public sector, and uh, the, 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 the whole aspects of what we're going to do. How now? We've been talking about this, like I said, for many years, and I now desperately, desperately want to hear an answer and a solution for Uganda. How do we now ensure that Uganda is going to move from a mineral potential classification to becoming a mining nation. How, Jennifer? You are here as Javois, as the, the, uh, the private sector. How are you going to help us become a mining sector? And then even going back to the conference theme, minerals value addition, <laughs> <laughs> to look at downstream beneficiation, yeah. we need minerals, so we need mines. Yeah. And for most of these commodities we're talking about, uh, we don't have enough production or enough minerals. If we look at tungsten, we're producing 200 tons per year. We need at least 2,000 tons per year. If we look at copper, uh, historically, Kalembe was producing 25 to 30,000 tons per year. That needs to be expanded greatly, but a small or medium-sized copper smelter is about 350,000 tons per year. 
So we need to find 10 of those. Mm. Um, so this is what we're talking about, and this is what we're trying to do. Uh, we need to attract a lot of companies. The more companies that we have here that are active and doing serious exploration and investing in following the standards, as we heard about, um, the more likelihood that we'll have more discoveries. Um, because a lot of projects don't lead to discovery, as we were saying earlier, they don't succeed. So if we can attract a lot of companies, our chances of success uh, increase greatly in terms of getting to the point of saying, yes, let's build a mine, let's develop a mine. Uh, what we need to do to attract companies, we already have massive geologic risk. We talked about the money spent. You can get to a phase and find that the geology yeah. is not in your favor and you lose that money. We need to think about risk reduction. So companies look at risk such as political risk or conflict risk, which is, a, of course, a deterrent for a lot of companies, say, looking at Congo as an example. Um, they look at risk of expropriation, as has been seen in a few African countries recently. You would not go to a country and invest years and years and millions of dollars to find something, develop it, if there's a risk that the government will just take it. Um, uh, there's a case actually in Pakistan right now, a company spent $250 million on exploration and then the government said, that's nice, we want that. So you don't go to those countries. Uh, then there's, there's risk uh, related to uh, legal and regulatory framework. And we're going to hear about that, I think, in the next session. Is it stable? Is it predictable? Um, and is it fair? Is the fiscal regime, is it fair to government and is it fair to companies? And then is it competitive? We don't want to race to the bottom as in, okay, the companies get everything, the government gets nothing. That's not what Africa wants. That's not what even companies want. It's bad for companies reputationally. But what is fair and what is competitive, you do need to look at other countries around the world and see where you sit because other international companies are looking at that. And then, um, yeah, predictability and stability. Mine, I mean, I always think we're doing exploration, but I think in the communities where we're working, if we develop a mine there, we become part of that community. We're talking about 10 years, maybe 15 years, hopefully even longer if it's big. So you need stability and predictability. You don't want to get to, uh, some countries, for instance, um, I won't mention the name, there's a country in Asia where every time there's a new uh, government change, they cancel all the mining contracts and change the mining law. So they're ranked number five in the world in terms of mineral potential, but they're always in the bottom five in terms of investment attractiveness. The minerals are there, but you won't go. Yeah. So we need to reduce risk, and, and the new uh, law, the new uh, mining law is one way to do that. So, Perfect. and we can do that. Yeah. Let's do Felix, it. Felix, just <laughs> add on to yours, and there's one other thing, but anyway, you carry on. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to <laughs> prim, uh, prompt you on this. Some in the, in the words of a very famous leader, I think it was Abraham Lincoln, once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I think that um, the time has come for us to really um, move from only talking, aspiring, to really creating what we want to see. And I think that Jennifer has touched on this uh, very well. I think one of the ways that uh, Uganda can benefit from this is, is I, I, would, I would probably try to summarize in three things. Mm -hmm. One is, is, is being able to have transparency on what we actually have. And I think we have, we, have, we, have, we have talked about that already. And when we have the competent people who are giving us competent um, you know, assessment of our resources and being able to give us mm -hmm. the, the dependable figures, and that transparency translates to investor confidence and ensuring that when an investor coming here knows that this is the potential I have in such an area. But secondly, and also very important, is, is the aspect of a very seamless and clear uh, uh, reporting line and requirement, what is required of you. And I think you've talked about this as well. But, uh, and, and so that you know that I have this paper trail. If I need to go to GSMD and get a license or a certificate for an exploration license, that should be seamless. There must be a very straightforward uh, you know, uh, process that you know you can even see that online. This is a global village now. I, yes. You don't have to come and walk and look for somebody and you know, call them and they're not available in office. This is something that comes back as well to the responsibility on the state so that we can have that seamless. But third and most importantly as well, 
is the aspect of a stable fiscal system. Because unless we have that stability in being able to say, okay, in Uganda, these are the regime we have, if we are going to bring in more laws and we're going to bring more regulations, it's not going to be disadvantageous to the system or the laws that are already there. For, but it will enhance it. And I almost wanted to come to you when you mentioned something about the laws in oil and gas. I wanted to say that we had that so many years ago. But the laws uh, that came in 2013 yeah. was yeah. actually improving what we already had. For, for example, we had laws in 1985, 1991, and so forth. So what we bring in is to improve because the angle of the, the, the most of exploration in terms of mineral resource management and exploitation has always not had, for example, components of environmental, social, uh, you know, things for many years. But since the green movement and trying to protect environment as an aspiration of the SDG, we have realized that, that those are very important components that we need to bring into the conversation. And Perfect. so I think with those, we can be able to have a very very good, robust environment for investors. Perfect, Perfect. Thank Philip. Thank you very much for that. Gershom. Um, thank you. So for me, what I want to uh, emphasize is this uh, partnership, uh, the joint ventures between the, the, the local people. We know that there is not enough uh, capital in the country, but let the investors, the local the licensees, use the little available capital that they have and do systematic exploration and then because often I get asked, do you have some projects around from different people? And when they have some results, then that is what the investor needs to be able to join in. And secondly, uh, when these people come and they want to invest some money, uh, sometimes there's an issue of uh, ownership and uh, control. Uh, you don't want to be, uh, uh, to want control, full control when uh, someone else is putting in uh, a lot of the money, the billions we are talking about. So uh, when it comes to the control, uh, once they have tr uh, trusted your project, then uh, you can also benefit. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I want to emphasize. Perfect. Gershom, thank you very much. I think that you can hear the lunch bells going off, so even most of our studio is going to be empty in literally 30 seconds from now because they can get their, their food from the canteen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, all to, to all of our viewers, um, I hope you've now understood the concept of what we're talking about with the, the mineral potential and being a mining nation. We must, we must do everything to achieve mining status and mining nation status over here in Uganda because we have a vast amount of potential. You have heard from Dr. Jennifer Hinton, who works for uh, and is the country manager for Jevois, who are doing phenomenal work here from the private sector. You've heard from Felix Bob of Cheat who is also part of the Petroleum Authority, which I'm not trying to mention as much because we did a lot of work with them earlier on in our 90 days of oil and gas, but he is an expert in the policies and the, and the processes that need to come into play on all types of minerals from this country to add value. And you've heard from Gershom who has been working and looking at our rock samples and our soils everywhere in Uganda to tell us that there is a lot of potential for us to get this done, but to get it done correctly. The biggest thing that we must also encompass in mining is that this is not something where you can go in, like you can go to a shop, uh, pay your landlord your rent, get some goods and sell those. Mining and exploration is over a period of time. And we have to start this work, not necessarily for our benefit only, but for the benefit of our, our children and our children's children, if we want our nation to be strong. So let's start thinking about how we can break ground in mining now. Let's set the foundations for our children to follow and let our children's children benefit and reap from what we are going to now sow for them. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, I wish you all a very good lunch. Do not forget to come back for our second, for the afternoon session, which will start off at two o'clock. And it is going to be talking about money. We've been talking about money and how much is required. Now we're going to find out about what it takes to finance and how much can we get locally and from outside. So with that, good afternoon to all the viewers and good afternoon to our, 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 our guests here in the studio. Thank you.